as part of linux commands for beginners so far we have gone through details related to all aspects associated with files and folders we started with setting up the environment then we have gone through the details about getting started with linux shell commands then we got into the details about listing and finding files and folders in linux also how to process data in files using certain linux commands also we have spent enough time to understand file and folder properties then we have gone through the details about managing files and folders in linux using commands such as cp mv rm etc as we have spent quite a lot of time understanding all the aspects related to files and folders using linux commands now it is time for us to explore the system commands in linux we'll start with all of core components of a computer such as memory cpu storage etc then we'll actually go through the details about how to get cpu details using lscpu command then we'll go through the details about free which actually give us memory details after going through lscpu and free we'll also see the details about storage using df command also we should be able to use a command called as du to get the usage of a file or folder on the hard drive it will actually give us the disk usage details for a given file or folder then we'll actually go through the automations around du command in conjunction with uh, commands such as sort find etc we'll perform few tasks around finding the largest files and folders using du and other commands by the end of this section or module you will not only be comfortable with commands such as lscpu free df and du you will also touch some of the automations around du command these can come handy in troubleshooting some of the issues not only as part of your work environment even as part of your personal computers you should be able to understand how your hard drive is being used whether the hard drive is effectively used or not you should be able to troubleshoot and also you can actually take required actions to reclaim the wasted storage uh, with unnecessary files that being said make sure you spend time and understand all these important commands in detail Yes, part of the sectional module, we are going through the details related to basic system commands in Linux. Before going through the basic uh, system commands such as ls, cpu, free, df, du, etc., let's get an overview of a computer. A computer is nothing but a combination of CPU, memory, storage. Those are the core components. On top of it, you will be having motherboard. There will be a case around it. Uh, then it will be treated as a laptop or desktop. That being said, the core components of a computer are nothing but CPU, memory, storage. Also, network interface card is also very important, which will facilitate us to connect to the external world. That being said, once we get the computer, we install operating system on top of it, and then we install softwares on top of it. Now, let's get an overview about CPU, memory, and storage for our Windows system. Then we'll actually go through the details related to the important commands in Linux to get similar details. Now, to get information about your uh, Windows uh, desktop, you can actually go to the File Explorer. Uh, first, I'll start with uh, the uh, storage. You can actually go to this PC here and you should be able to see the details related to the storage. When it comes to this computer, there are two drives, C drive and D drive. D drive is temporary storage. C drive is permanent one. You can see that there is uh, 128 GB storage on this. Overall, we have 128 GB of storage on this C drive. Now, if you wanted to get the details about memory as well as the CPU, there are multiple ways to get it. One, you can actually right click on this PC, then click on properties. You will get details about the memory. You can see that the system has 16 GB memory. You can also get the details about CPU. However, it is not quite obvious whether we have quad core or dual core or octa core CPU, which means whether we have two processors if it is dual core, four processors if it is quad core, eight processors if it is octa core and so forth. That information is not apparent or obvious by looking at these details. To get the number of processors or cores for this system, you can actually open the task manager. Let me see how I can actually get into the task manager. In the older versions of Windows, you should be able to get the task manager from here, but now it is not showing. We can actually go to the search and then search for task manager here. For some reason, the text is gone. Let me search for task manager. You see the task manager app. You should be able to click on this. Then you can actually go to the performance. You should be able to see the details here. Uh, when it comes to the storage, it is 128 GB. You can see that disk is selected here. You can also get the details about the memory here. You can see that uh, it has total 16 GB memory. It is showing here itself. As of now, 3.9 GB is in usage. 12.1 uh, GB is free. Now, when it comes to the CPU, you should be able to get the details of CPU by clicking on this. As part of this uh, screen, you should be interpreting sockets, cores, 
and logical processors. When it comes to sockets, there is only one socket, which means there is only one CPU. When it comes to cores, there are two cores in this one CPU, which means the CPU is a dual core CPU. That's why it is saying two. These are physical cores. However, depending upon the nature of the CPU and also the nature of workloads, we can actually define logical number of processors also. By default, for this machine, the logical process is for. In many cases, you might be able to customize this as well. Don't worry too much about it. For now, just keep in mind that we have one CPU. It is nothing but dual core CPU. So CPU is one with two cores in it. We have 16 GB memory, and then when it comes to storage, we have two drives: C drive and D drive. D drive is a temporary storage. As part of the C drive, we have 128 GB. This is how you should be able to get details about the core components of a computer or a laptop or a desktop. Now let's go to the details about how to get these details using Linux commands. I'll be covering the details in multiple lectures in this sectional module. As part of this section, we are going through the details related to basic system commands in Linux to get the details about CPU, memory, storage, etc. Already we have gotten an overview about core components of a computer, which are nothing but CPU, memory, and disk or storage. In this lecture, let's go through the details about how to get details about the CPU on a Linux-based system. When it comes to this Windows system, we have one socket, which means one CPU. It have a two-core CPU, uh, which means we have one dual-core CPU. Now let's see how we can actually get those details using Linux. When it comes to the Linux, there is a command called as lscpu. It will actually give us the details about the CPU related to a computer on which Linux operating system is installed. Now let me hit enter. You can see the details here. You can see that there is one socket. When it comes to cores, there are two cores in this socket, which means it's a dual core CPU. However, each core have two threads. You can see the details here. As we have two threads per core, uh, total uh, CPUs are nothing but four. You can see the details here. Also, for each of these four CPUs, there will be ID. You can see the ID ranges here. The ID ranges are in between zero to three. This is how you should be able to get the details of the system on which Linux is installed. The command which we have used is nothing but lscpu. That being said. You can also get some advanced details such as cache details and also the speed details by interpreting this information. For regular users like us, they are not that important. As long as we have the details about how many CPUs we have, how many cores we have in each CPU, and also how many threads we have per core, this is the information which is important as regular users of Linux-based operating system on top of a computer. You can also get more details about lscpu command by saying lscpu-help. You can see there are quite a few control arguments. You can explore those and you should be able to get more details about your CPU. lscpu is a very important command to understand details about your CPU associated with the computer on which you are actually using this Linux-based operating system. That being said, as we have got the details related to lscpu or how to get the details related to the CPU using lscpu, now it is time for us to understand how to get the details about the memory that is associated with this system. Yeah, as part of the sectional module, we are going through the details about basic system commands in Linux to actually get details about the core components. The core components of a computer are nothing but CPU, memory, and storage. After getting an overview about these using Windows, we have even gone through the command called as lscpu to get CPU details using Linux-based operating system. Now, let's understand how to get the details of memory in Linux using a command called as free. Keep in mind that this Linux-based system is set up on top of Windows using WSL, and hence whatever details you are seeing as part of this Windows-based system might reflect even as part of Linux. That's why, as part of the previous lecture, when we have gone through the lscpu command, most of the details you have seen here are visible even as part of the output of the lscpu command. When it comes to the memory details, you can see that. There is total 16 GB memory on the system, out of which 3.7 GB is in use and 12.1 GB is available. Now we should be able to get similar details in Linux-based system using a command called as free. So let's say free here and see the output. In this case, the output is not very readable. Keep in mind that wherever human readability is relevant, there will be a control argument called as hyphen H. So in this case, I can say free hyphen H, which stands for human readable. You should be able to see the output in human readable format. Even though we have 16 GB memory on the Windows-based machine, which is also known as host for this uh, guest, 
this Linux based system which is set up on top of Windows can be treated as guest whereas the Windows based system can be treated as host. So even though host have 16 GB memory where Windows is running for this uh, virtual machine only 8 GB is allocated. You can confirm by looking at total it is close to 8 GB here. Out of this uh, total 8 GB as of now 220 MB is being used by this uh, Linux based system. 7.4 GB is free. Available is also 7.4 GB. Many times available will be greater than free because available is equal to free plus shared plus buffer cache memory. That is how you should be able to interpret the output of free command here. You can also get usage of free command by saying free hyphen hyphen help. You can see that there are quite a few control arguments with respect to free. You can go to the details and understand. If you want to get the information in bytes, you can actually say free hyphen B. You can also say hyphen K to get the information in kilobytes. You can also say hyphen M to get details in megabit bytes. You can also use hyphen H to actually show the output in a human readable format. I typically use free hyphen H to get the details about memory on a given system where Linux is running. That being said, as we have gone through the details with respect to CPU and memory, now it is time for us to explore commands related to getting details about the storage. We will be covering those details as part of the subsequent lectures in the sectional module. In the process of exploring basic system commands to get details related to memory, CPU, storage, etc. on a Linux based system, so far we have gone through the details related to uh, CPU and memory. Now it is time for us to go through the details related to storage. Keep in mind that the Linux based machine is set up on top of Windows as a guest. The way the Linux based system is set up is by using something called as WSL or Windows subsystem for Linux. When it comes to the host on which Windows is running, there are two drives, C drive and D drive. C drive contain 128 GB of storage whereas D drive contain 32 GB of storage. Now to get these details using the Linux based system, you should be able to use command called as DF. You can see the details here. When it comes to the output, it is showing in bytes. If you want to get in a readable format, you should be able to use df-h. Now the output will be in readable format. When it comes to the host on which this Linux based system is set up, you can see that there is only 128 GB in C drive and 32 GB in D drive. However, if you look at the output, if you look at the root file system, it is actually showing 250 GB plus here. Don't worry too much about it. Ignore it for now. To get details about C drive and D drive, you have to look at these two entries. You see, there is something called as DRVFS or drive file system. You can see size is 128 GB, used is 30 GB, available is 97 GB. In percentage, as of now, 24% is used. And you can see the mount point using which it is actually getting this storage details. In this case, this mount point is related to the C drive, which you are seeing here. You can see we have 127 GB here. You can also confirm that here. When it comes to the C drive, it is nothing but 127 GB. In similar lines, uh, you can actually see the details about D drive. When it comes to the D drive, it has 32 GB uh, total storage out of which 2.5 is currently being used. Available is 30 GB. This is how you should be able to get details about the all the drives mounted on a Linux based system, you just need to make sure which drive you should be focusing on to get details which you are looking for. You can also actually say df-h and then dot which represents the current working directory to see how much storage is supposed to be used by this drive. If you look at the path, you can see that this directory ITVST is under users which is under mount C which means this is related to this mount point. Now I should be able to get details about only this mount point. Let me hit enter. You can see that uh, there is 127 GB total storage associated with this mount point on which this directory ITVST exists. In similar lines you can also go to mnt d then you can run df-h and you can see the details about the mount point associated with this path. Let's see what we have in this folder. There are only system folders and files. I don't want to play with them. 
for now we can ignore so this is how you should be able to get details about file system df is very important command to understand the situation of all the mount points that are associated with the linux based system in this case as this linux is running on top of windows using wsl we just need to focus on these two depending upon the nature of your linux based system you might have to explore different file systems that are associated with your linux system to get details about how much storage is allocated to the machine and also how much of it is currently being used and how much of it is is actually available as we have understood how to get details about storage using df command let's go to the details related to another important command with respect to storage it is nothing but du du stands for disk usage i'll be covering the details related to du in the next lecture at this time we are going through the basic linux commands to get details related to the linux based system so far we have gone through the details about cpu using ls cpu memory using free and storage using df command another important command with respect to storage is nothing but du du stands for disk usage it gives us the details about how much storage is being used by a folder or a file now i am in the home folder in this linux based system you can actually use pwd command to get the present working directory it is nothing but home d gajaraju now when it comes to the disk usage there is a command called as du you can hit enter when it comes to the simple usage of du command it will just go through all the folders and files recursively and get details about how much storage is occupied by each and every file and folder also it will actually aggregate and give us the details about the folder we, from which we have ran the du command you can see that this is the total size occupied by this folder which is nothing but slash home slash dgadaraju now let's look at the usage of du command to see what all options it gives typically i use s and h i will emphasize on those two control arguments let me say du hyphen hyphen help and then hit enter we should be able to see the usage of the du command we can actually go up and look at the control arguments there are quite a few of them whenever we talk about storage or memory we want to see the details in human readable format for that we can use hyphen h this is one of the important control argument with respect to du and the important control argument is nothing but hyphen s or hyphen hyphen summarize hyphen hyphen human readable is alias for hyphen h hyphen hyphen summarize is alias for hyphen s so we use hyphen s and hyphen h very often with du command to get details in human readable format and also summarized at the level which we are looking for now let me scroll down here now instead of saying du let me say du hyphen s and hit enter now you can see that it have summarized the overall uh, storage details that is being used by each and every file and folder and you can see the total size here however i am not sure whether it is bytes or uh, kilobytes or megabytes etc to make sure we get the output in human readable format i can actually say h now you can see that it is showing in human readable format the actual storage that is occupied by this current folder is nothing but 3.1 gb if you say df hyphen h it will actually give us the details about the overall storage of this uh, system i can also say df hyphen h dot when it comes to this one it is under the root uh, file system as it is under root file system it is showing 250 gb but under the hood it have only 128 gb actual storage probably the host uh, drives that are there on windows system might be configured with concept called as raid when it comes to raid with mirroring typically the storage will be double that's why you might be seeing this one so df hyphen h will give us the details about the overall storage associated with this mount point if you use dot at the end whereas du hyphen sh will get details about how much storage is used by this current folder in this case slash home slash dgadaraju use 3.2 gb out of this 251 gb storage that being said now you can also say du hyphen sh star instead of recursively going through each and every folder and file and uh, Uh, giving us the storage it will only give us storage at each and every folder level or file level in this folder you can hit enter and you should be able to see the output in this folder we have folders as well as files you can actually run lsf and ltr to confirm you can see that there are quite a few folders and files the files are nothing but uh, this one this one and this one rest all are folders only by using du hyphen sh uh, with star 
we are able to get aggregated information at each and every folder and file in this folder. The folder is nothing but slash home slash dgatherage. When it comes to desktop, it is nothing but folder. It occupies 4KB storage. When it comes to documents, it is also a folder and it occupies 4KB storage. When it comes to downloads, it is also a folder and it occupies 1.8 GB storage. Also, when it comes to data, it occupies 631 MB storage. When it comes to order underscore statuses, which is nothing but a file, it occupies 716 KB. Out of all the commands that give system details such as LSCPU, free, DF, DU, DU is the most effective command in troubleshooting the storage related issues. I'll be walking you through quite a few tasks to understand the importance of DU. Make sure you are really comfortable with DU. You should be not only comfortable with DU, but also how to integrate with other important commands and troubleshoot the issues. We'll be performing quite a few tasks from that perspective. Make sure you follow the subsequent lectures in this section and be comfortable with all those scenarios which I'm going to cover. At this time, we are going through the details about basic system commands to get details such as CPU, memory, storage, etc. So far, we have explored LSCPU for CPU, free for memory, and also DF and DU for storage. That being said, DU is a very powerful command. It helps us troubleshooting issues related to the storage. Many times, our hard drives might fill for several reasons. We might want to understand which folder is actually taking up more amount of storage. And one of the ways to troubleshoot the issue is by using DU command. However, we need to use du with commands such as sort in conjunction then we should be able to get the information we are looking for in this lecture as well as few subsequent lectures let's understand how to use du in conjunction with commands such as sort to get insights about the utilization of storage in our systems so in this case i'm using the linux based system that is set up on top of windows i have a folder called as data let me get into that data folder now i can actually say du hyphen sh and then a dot it will give the summary of the folder which I am in. You can actually see the details. The overall storage of this folder is nothing but 631 megabytes. You can see here. Now there are quite a few folders here. If I say ls ltr we should be able to see all the folders and also file in this. We are not sure about uh, each and every folder how much storage uh, they are occupying. So one of the ways is by saying du-sh star. Now you can see the output here. The file readme.md is of size 4 KB. When it comes to cards it is of size 25 MB. Election results is 872 KB. HR is 44 KB. HR underscore DB is 152 KB, so and so forth. Many times we wanted to see the top occupying folders or files at the bottom or at the top. To get the, those details, we might have to pipe the output of uh, du command to sort and we should be able to see the results. Now in this case, if I just say du hyphen sh star and then use sort command, it will actually sort the data based on the alphanumeric characters that are there in the size. You can see that 134 megabytes came at the top and 95 megabytes came at the bottom because 9 is greater than 1. So data is actually sorted in ascending order by uh, alphanumeric characters that are there in the size rather than the numeric values. To make sure data is sorted based upon the numeric values, you can actually say sort hyphen n and hit enter. Now you can see that the output is changed, but still because 872 is bigger than uh, 152 or 134, it came at the last. However, 134 megabytes is large in size compared to 872 KB. You can use this approach. However, you need to make sure you remove H so that the larger files come at the bottom. So in this case, I can say du hyphen yes without H. Then star, star will ensure data is uh, summarized at each and every folder level. Let me remove this uh, sort hyphen n. Let me run this first. You can see the output here. It have actually presented the data in the form of kilobytes here. The default behavior is to display the sizes in kilobytes. Now I should be able to use sort and we should be able to sort the data. Keep in mind that data is sorted using alphanumeric uh, values, not numeric values that are there as part of the first field in this. To make sure data is sorted numerically rather than alphanumerically, we just have to use sort hyphen n. Now we should be able to see the output here. This is how you should be able to deep dive and understand which folder is uh, occupying how much storage. And also you should be able to narrow down to larger folders or files at the bottom by combining uh, du-s output with sort. This is a very simple one-liner which will facilitate us to get the usage of our storage effectively. We have combined the power of two very important commands. They are nothing but du and sort. You just need to have a bit of understanding about these commands and you should be able to solve very complex problems. That being said, now let me go one level up. Let me run du-s star. 
then sort hyphen n let me hit enter we should be able to get the details about the size of each and every folder and file in this location in ascending order by the size of each and every file and folder let's wait until it is run then we'll take it further it will take time based upon the amount of data it is supposed to be sorted now you can review the output here downloads is the largest folder which is occupying 1.8 gb followed by data which occupies 646 mb followed by projects which occupies 266 mb so and so forth you should now be able to get into the downloads folder and see what all folders and files are actually taking up storage in downloads folder and you can actually start cleaning up downloads folder let me go to the downloads folder here now let's run ls ltr you can see that there are only two entries one is file second one is folder now we should be able to run command saying du hyphen sh star now we should be able to see the details the folder contains 1.3 gb of data whereas this file is 482 mb in size this is how we should be able to get the details about the folders and files with respect to size and we can understand how much storage is being occupied by these files and folders if you want now you can actually get into this folder called as pycharm community 2021.3.3 then let's run ls hyphen ltr you have several folders and files in this now i can say du hyphen sh star and hit enter you should be able to see the size of each and every folder and file in this location lib is the folder which is taking most amount of storage followed by plugins then followed by jvr so and so forth let's see quite a few examples to understand the power of du to troubleshoot issues related to wasting the storage on our systems i'll also go through the details using my mac you can also apply this on top of windows provided you have a linux virtual machine on top of windows and windows storage is mounted onto that you can actually follow whatever i'm going to demonstrate on mac on your windows as well using linux uh, on top of windows let's go through the details so that you understand what i'm talking about here at this time we are going through the details about basic system commands to get details about our systems such as cpu memory storage etc now we are actually performing tasks to troubleshoot the issue of how our storage is being spent now let me actually walk you through the details about how to leverage linux that is set up using wsl to troubleshoot the issue on top of folders such as downloads or even other folders on windows based system first you need to understand how windows folders are actually exposed onto these virtual machines and then we can take it further let me exit from here in this case i'm in the powershell you can see that uh, the path is nothing but c drive users it university this is nothing but home folder on windows and here you have a folder called as downloads you can see the downloads folder here if you want to get the storage details about this downloads folder you can actually launch wsl provided you have set up uh, ubuntu based system using wsl in this case the default system is nothing but ubuntu one i have only one you can see the star here if i say wsl it will actually get into this uh, ubuntu based machine and by default in ubuntu also will be getting into this folder you can see that it is saying mount c c drive is represented as mount c in linux because linux doesn't have the concept of c drive d drive etc underneath mount c you have users then followed by it varsity now if i say ls hyphen ltr it will actually return all the folders which you have seen earlier it also provides some additional details you can ignore those additional details for now now you can actually say du hyphen sh downloads to get the details about the downloads folder you can see that the downloads folder in my case is 5.6 mb in your case you might end up uh, having a lot more uh, folders and files than me the size might be quite bigger if you think there are quite a few files which are not necessary to see which files and folders are wasting the storage and if you want to clean up those things using the du command in combination with sort we should be able to identify those larger folders or files and we can take it further now you can actually go to downloads then you should be able to run ls and ltr to see all the folders and files i have only files here i don't have any folders using ls command itself we should be able to get size of the files but if you have folders you will not be able to get size of those folders now i can say du hyphen s star then sort hyphen n i should be able to get the files in ascending order by size now i should be able to delete the larger files if they are not required it is applicable even with folders now let's understand how these folders and files are represented in windows for that i'm actually going into the file explorer i have opened the file explorer i have the downloads folder in this case we can actually see the size of the files and we should be able to sort the data by size or by kind so and so forth 
even we can sort the data by dates. That being said, when it comes to folders, you will not be seeing the sizes here. That's where the combination of du and sort comes handy. Now let me go to the other folder, let's say documents. There's only one file. I don't have many files and folders in the system. I don't use that often. But uh, when it comes to the folders, you will not be seeing the size. For example, let's say downloads here. Now let me create a folder, new folder archive. Now let me copy these files into it. When it comes to folders, you will not be seeing the size here. You will get the details about the folder size and all once you hover your mouse onto it or when you actually look at the properties. You can see more details here. The size is 5.5 MB and also it contains three files. You should be able to troubleshoot the details related to the sizes of these folders and files using properties. Then you should be able to delete. However, if you have too many folders and files, troubleshooting the sizes and deciding whether to delete or not can be very time consuming. We should be able to use the combination of du with sort and we should be able to get those files and folders which are larger in size at the bottom and then we can actually troubleshoot further what should be retained, what should be deleted and we can take the required action. That is what we are trying to achieve. Now let me move on to my Mac and see how I am going to troubleshoot the issues. You can actually follow the similar steps using your Windows as well. I am just trying to make it interesting. I will be demonstrating using Mac. You can actually implement using Linux on top of your Windows based system. As we have understood quite a few details with respect to du, let's go to the details about how to use du along with sort to troubleshoot some of the complex issues. We can also use du with find. I will also go to the details about using find along with du to actually troubleshoot the issues much deeper. That being said, let me open the terminal here. Let me close the existing terminal and then let me open again. Keep in mind that even though I am going through the details using downloads of my Mac because I don't have enough files on Windows and Linux that is set up on top of Windows, you should follow me and you should be able to troubleshoot your issues. The way you can actually go to the downloads folder is once you launch WSL, make sure you are in the home directory of your Windows, then you should be able to go to the downloads folder, then you should be able to run the commands which I am going to demonstrate using my Mac. Now I am in the home directory on my Mac. I'm actually getting into downloads folder. Let's run ls-ltr. You can see that it have listed all the files and folders in downloads folder. You should be able to run similar command as part of your Linux based system that is set up on top of your windows to actually troubleshoot the issues on your windows downloads folder. That being said, now we should be able to get the total size of this downloads folder by saying du-sh then dot hit enter. You can see that my downloads folder is 794 MB. Now I would like to see which files or folders are actually occupying most amount of storage. For that, I should be able to say du hyphen s star. It will give us the size with respect to each and every file and folder. Uh, to make sure we get larger files and folders at the bottom, we should be able to run command called as uh, du hyphen s star sort hyphen n. Now you can see larger files at the bottom. If you want to make this information a little bit readable, you can actually say du-sk uh, or m which will actually give us the output in megabytes not kilobytes. The default is kilobytes. Now we are actually trying to get the output in megabytes. Now you can see here it have given the output in megabytes. PyCharm community blah 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 is 480 megabyte whereas when it comes to KB it is actually 982,160 KB. I think there is some difference with respect to what is being shown here without uh, hyphen m and with hyphen m. 982,160 KB will not convert to 400 plus MB. So this could be something else. It need not be kilobytes. Don't worry too much about it. You just use hyphen m like this. Everything will be converted to megabytes and you should be able to see the data in megabytes. However, all those files which are under one megabyte, it is actually showing it as one here. Now, that being said, this is how you should be able to get the largest files at the bottom. If you feel these are not relevant anymore, you can delete these files. Now, let me actually run du-sh dot once again. The overall size is nothing but 794 MB. Now, let's go ahead and delete some of the files which are not relevant. This is not relevant. This is also not relevant. This is also not relevant. This is related to PyCharm. Once we download, we have already installed PyCharm. This is related to VMware client. 
this is related to filezilla all these three are not important anymore on this machine and hence i am deleting this for that i should be able to use rm command i should be able to copy paste this one then copy paste this one and also copy paste this one now let me run it all the three files are deleted now we should be able to say du hyphen sh dot and hit enter you can see that we have reclaimed almost 500 plus megabytes of storage on this machine like this we should be able to navigate to the folders and clean up all those files which are occupying too much of storage provided those files are not important anymore now let's go one level up let's run ls hyphen ltr you can see that there are quite a few folders in this home directory as of now i am in my home directory now i should be able to say du hyphen sh then dot to get overall storage that is occupied by my account let's wait until it is run you can see that there are quite a few files under my home directory for which my account doesn't have access you also might run into uh, permission related issues on some of the files and folders for now ignore them look at the bottom the size of this folder is nothing but 89 gigabytes now to troubleshoot which folder is occupying most amount of storage we should be able to say du hyphen sh star hit enter we can see the output here but there are quite a few errors there is a way to bypass these errors for now you just follow this don't worry too much if you don't understand i'll be covering the details at a later point in time after saying du space uh, hyphen sh then space then star you leave a space and then use uh, two like this then have a greater than symbol like this then say slash dev slash null then hit enter now you can see that the errors are gone the errors are not displayed but we are able to get the details about the sizes of each and every folder and file that being said we should be able to use du hyphen s m like this to get the output in megabytes then we should be able to say sort hyphen n to get the largest folders or files at the bottom you can see library is the largest one which is taking away 66 gb of storage then movies around 17 gb so and so forth this is how you should be able to get details about the usage of your hard drive with these files and folders it is a very powerful mechanism you should be comfortable with it it will come handy in many ways not only to maintain the files and folders better on your systems but also when you actually get into the projects whenever you run into storage related issues you should be able to solve problems using this simple approach that being said now we have so many folders and files we would like to see which files are actually taking away too much of storage without navigating to folders one at a time we should be able to leverage find in conjunction with du to get the details we'll go to those details as part of the next lecture at this time we are going through the details about using du command to understand the usage of our files and folders in our systems i'm actually demonstrating using mac you should be able to use linux on top of windows also to actually go to the folders and files in windows that being said i am currently in the home directory as part of the previous lecture i have ran this command it took care of uh, giving the details about the size of uh, each and every folder in megabytes. The largest one is library followed by movies, projects, etc. Now let's say we'd like to troubleshoot which file is larger in movies. One of the ways is to go to each folder and uh, validate, but it is not very effective way of uh, understanding which file is larger. We should be able to leverage the combination of find command and du command and we should be able to get the details about the size of the files in ascending order. We can actually get the largest files at the bottom by going through all the folders recursively in movies. Let's go through the details so that you understand what I'm talking about here. First, let's see how many files we have in this movies folder. For that, we should be able to use find command like this, find movies, then hyphen type F. It will give us the details about all the files. You can hit enter and you can see. Now you should be able to say pipe WC hyphen L to get the number of files. We have 196 files. These 196 files constitute almost 17 GB in size. You can actually say du hyphen sh movies. You can see that the size of movies is 17 GB. Now let's say we would like to explore which file is actually occupying most amount of storage. We should be able to use the same find command. This will actually give us the individual files. Now we should be able to use hyphen exec. We should be able to pass any command to hyphen exec which is compatible with files that are written using find command in this case we should be able to use du command to get size of each and every file so i can say du then 
I should be able to use curly braces like this. Then plus, then semicolon, hit enter. Now you can see the size of each and every file in MB or actually in uh, whatever default unit it is. To get in MB, I should be able to use hyphen M like this. It will give us the sizes of these files in MB. However, you can see that the data is not sorted. To make sure data is sorted, we have to use the same find command. However, we have to remove the semicolon at the end, then pipe, then we have to say sort hyphen n. Now we should be able to get the largest file at the bottom. The largest file is nothing but this one. Now let me get into this movies, then Camtasia 2021, then temporary recordings. Then let me run LSF and LTR. Now let me say du hyphen sh star. You can see there's one file which is more than 16 GB. Now we should be able to delete this file if it is not relevant anymore. It is shooted on 15th December 2021. If it is just lying around, if I'm not using it, then we should not be wasting our storage like this. I can just say rm and then I should be able to say rec then 12-15-2021 then space 25.trec as there are spaces in the file name we have to escape space like this otherwise it will try to look for the files with rec name then this name then this name by escaping the spaces this entire string will be considered as one there is a file with that name and hence that file will be deleted now the file is deleted let me go up to the uh, home folder now let me say du hyphen sh movies earlier it was occupying 17 gb of storage now it is only 564 mb by just spending few minutes we are able to reclaim almost 16 and half gb of storage which is being wasted for quite some time this is how you should be able to manage your storage using these simple commands the command which i have used to troubleshoot is nothing but this one it have given me the details about the files in ascending order by size that are part of movies folder using this approach i'm able to get the data sorted in ascending order by size i'm able to figure out there is one file which is occupying almost 16 and half gb of storage i have reviewed whether it is relevant or not as it is not relevant it is deleted that being said now if i say du hyphen s or du hyphen m then star then sort hyphen n let me use the command which I have used earlier, which is nothing but this one, where the errors are redirected to null device. Now let's review the output here. Let's also go to the library folder. Be careful when you try to touch folders such as library because uh, you will be deleting some important folders which can cause issues to your operating system library is supposed to be system folder however at least you will know which folders or files are actually occupying too much of storage and uh, you can actually work with uh, your apple support or windows support to make sure you clean up those things in a graceful manner that being said let's go to the details about how to understand the usage of different files and folders in library for that again we can leverage the same command which you have seen earlier which is nothing but this one let's clean up movies replace it with library let's run this it will go through all the files and it will give us the sizes in ascending order by getting the sizes in MB. You can see that Docker is the culprit. Docker is taking away almost uh, 42 GB of storage. That too, docker.raw. It can be a file system which is being used by one of the Docker containers on my system. This is how you should be able to troubleshoot the issues related to which files are actually consuming most amount of storage on your system. It will definitely add value to your uh, daily usage of your system. Make sure you are comfortable with commands such as find, du, etc. In this case, with the usage of simple commands such as find, du, sort, etc., we are able to figure out which files are actually taking away too much of storage. If the files are not important, we should be able to clean up and reclaim the storage. That being said, this video will be broadcasted in the social platforms. In case if you put in practice and able to reclaim some storage, feel free to share your experience in the social platforms. We'll be motivated to create more and more content like this which can be used as part of your day-to-day -day usage. As part of the sectional module, we are going through the details related to comparing files and folders in Linux. We should be able to use diff command to compare files as well as folders. Before getting into the actual examples, let's see the usage of diff command. To get the usage of diff command, we can actually say diff hyphen hyphen help hit enter we should be able to see quite a lot of details with respect to diff command diff can be used to see the differences uh, between the files and also to see the differences between the folders 
There are quite a few control arguments which actually gives us a lot of uh, features with respect to comparing files and folders. Uh, one of the important one is uh, hyphen r or hyphen hyphen recursive. It can be used to recursively compare all the files and folders uh, between two different folders. We'll see examples so that you understand what I'm talking about here. Also, when it comes to comparing the contents of the files and folders, we should be able to use hyphen i or hyphen hyphen ignore case. It will just ignore the case and it will just compare based upon the strings without worrying too much about the case. Also, there are quite a few options dealing with spaces. You can uh, deal with the trailing spaces. You can ignore them while comparing using these options. You can also ignore all spaces using these options. Also, you can ignore blank lines uh, while comparing using these options. Like this, there are quite a few options. That being said, let's start performing the tasks. We'll start with comparing the files. Then we'll also get into the comparing the folders. Also, we'll see a few examples with respect to dealing spaces, lines, so and so forth. Let's deep dive and understand this very important command in detail by performing hands-on tasks with simulated datasets. As part of this sectional module, we are going through the details related to comparing files and folders in Linux using diff. So far, we have seen the value of diff command. Now, let's make sure we have appropriate datasets so that we can actually explore diff command in detail. Diff command can be used to compare the code bases and also to compare the datasets. In this case, we'll be using datasets. Already, we have seen data folder quite a few times in the past. Let's see what we have under the home directory. There is a data folder, however, it might got corrupted over a period of time. As we have taken the backup, uh, let's uh, restore using the backup and then we'll take it further. For now, I'm actually saying rm-rf data to remove the data folder. Now I should be able to say tar-xvf data.tar. Hit enter, it will take care of restoring the data folder. Once the data folder is restored, we should be able to get into the data folder. We have several folders in this. We'll be picking uh, retail underscore db to explore diff command in detail. I'll be creating another copy of retail underscore db uh, with the name retail underscore db underscore csv. So let me say cp hyphen r, then retail underscore db, then retail underscore db underscore csv. Now we have two datasets, retail underscore db and retail underscore db underscore csv. Using diff, we should be able to compare the folder or individual files as well. First, let's start with the individual files, then we'll take it further. However, as of now, both the folders are identical. And hence, if we just try to compare, it will not show any results. To make sure we get the actual results when we use the diff command, let's manipulate some data in retail underscore db underscore csv, then we'll take it further. To manipulate, we can actually go to retail underscore db underscore csv. There is a folder called as the departments. Let's get into the departments folder. The reason why I have chosen a departments folder is because it is a small dataset. Now, let me say ls hyphen ltr. We have a file by name part hyphen five zeros. Now, let's say cat then part hyphen five zeros to preview the data. You can see that it contains six records. Now let me open this part hyphen five zeros using VA editor. You can choose your favorite editor. If you're not comfortable using VA editor, you can use nano or you can also use some other editor on your Windows based machine and then you can actually copy paste the content and you can take it further. Now let me actually change fitness to fitness with small f rather than capital F. So this is one of the difference we have. Then let me say footwear instead of w e a r let me say w a r e and the typo with respect to data now let me add few empty lines here let me add few empty lines here also let me remove the space here and also let me add spaces before as well as after with four apparel i'm going to add before with six outdoors i have added towards the end you can see that the cursor is after few blank spaces after outdoors. So we have manipulated quite a few things in this file. You can play with it and you can come up with quite a few manipulations based upon your interest and you can take it further. Now let me save. I have come out of it. Now let me go to the data folder by saying cd data. Now let me say ls hyphen ltr. We have retail underscore db as well as retail underscore db underscore csv. Now let me say ls hyphen ltr retail underscore db then departments and also ls hyphen ltr retail underscore db underscore csv departments 
then part hyphen five zeros. You see the size of this file is 77 bytes, whereas the size of this file is only 60 bytes. So looking at the size itself, we can see that there are some differences between these two files. Now let's go to the details about how to get the differences by using a diff command. Using a diff we'll be comparing these two files and we'll be trying to interpret the differences. If at all we have to fix, we can fix as well. As part of the section module, we are going through the details about comparing files and folders in Linux using diff. So far we have got the usage of diff command and also we have prepared the dataset to explore differences by using diff command in Linux. That being said, the two files which we want to use for simple comparison using diff uh, are nothing but these ones. Let me say ls-ltr, return underscore db, then departments, then part hyphen five zeros. The other file is nothing but uh, retail underscore db underscore csv then departments then part hyphen five zeros you can see the details here this file is of size 77 bytes whereas this file is of size 60 bytes that being said the simple usage of diff command will be like this diff then you have to pass the two arguments it can be the file names like this so i'm picking the first file name i'm passing it as first argument then picking the second file name I am passing it as second argument. There are no control arguments that are passed here. We are only passing the file names as arguments to the diff command. Now you can actually see the output. Now the differences are displayed. However, you should be in a position to interpret these things. You see for each and every line, there is a less than and greater than symbol. And also you see some numbers here. And also you have these hyphens. You need to understand all these details so that you can interpret these details. First, let's start with this. So in this case, it is saying the lines 1 to 3 from the first file which is nothing but this one are being compared with 1 to 7 lines in this file so it have compared the lines from 1 to 3 from the first file with the lines from 1 to 7 with this file and it is displaying the differences here with respect to the first file you can see the details here with respect to the second file you can see the details here also you see there are symbols such as less than and then greater than before each and every line that is being uh, emitted from these files. Uh, less than means the records are actually coming from the first argument or the lines are actually coming from the first argument. Greater than means the lines are actually coming from the second argument, which means these are the lines from the file which is passed as first argument. These are the lines that are coming from uh, the file which is passed as second argument. After that, you again see these numbers in this case, the lines 5 to 6 from first file are being compared with the lines 9 to 14 in the second file. These are the lines 5 and 6 from the first file. These are the lines between 9 to 14 from the second file. This is how you should be able to interpret the results that are generated by diff command. Also keep in mind that the results are displayed in groups. This is one group of results. This is another group of results. Within each group of results, the details from the first file and the second file are actually separated by this line with three hyphens. Uh, this is how you should be able to interpret the results generated by the simple diff command. Now let's go to the details about improving the comparisons when uh, the requirements are to ignore the blank lines or white spaces so and so forth. We'll be exploring the details as part of the next lecture.
एज पार्ट ऑफ दिस सेक्शन मॉड्यूल वी आर गोइंग टू द डिटेल्स रिलेटेड टू कंपेयरिंग फाइल्स एंड फोल्डर्स इन लिनक्स यूजिंग डिफ आफ्टर गेटिंग एन ओवरव्यू ऑफ डिफ कमांड वी हैव प्रिपेयर्ड द डेटा सेट देन वी हैव एक्सप्लोर्ड हाउ टू कंपेयर फाइल्स ऑन सर्टेन क्राइटेरिया वी हैव गॉन टू द डिटेल्स सच एज कंपेयरिंग बाय इग्नोरिंग ब्लैंक लाइंस वाइट स्पेसेस एंड आल्सो केस नाउ इट इज टाइम फॉर अस टू एक्सप्लोर हाउ टू यूज डिफ कमांड टू गेट डिफरेंसेस बिटवीन टू डिफरेंट फोल्डर्स इन दिस केस वी ऑलरेडी हैव टू डिफरेंट फोल्डर्स दे आर नथिंग बट रिटेल एंड स्कोर डीबी and retail underscore db underscore csv both of them have similar folders and files except one file differing uh, between the two it is nothing but part hyphen 50s under departments let's review the details by saying ls hyphen ltr retail underscore db then departments then part hyphen 50s and also retail underscore db underscore csv then departments then part hyphen 50s you can see the details here this file which is the original one is of size 60 bytes whereas this one which is manipulated is of size 77 bytes except this everything else is same now let's also copy a file called as readme.md which is there under data folder which is nothing but this one into retail_db_csv folder so let me say cp readme.md then retail_db_csv which means readme.md will be copied into this location we can validate by saying ls hyphen ltr on that location not this one actually let me run this command where we are actually getting uh, folders and files from retail db and retail underscore db underscore csv you can see readme.md as extra file under retail underscore db underscore csv now there are two important uh, control arguments which we can use while uh, recursively comparing between the folders in this case it will navigate through these two folders and it will check for the uh, files with same names and it will try to compare the files with same names in the two folder structures if there are files like this which are extra it will just report uh, as differences from that file let's use diff hyphen r hyphen r is for recursive you can actually go through the usage of diff command once again if you scroll up you have hyphen r or hyphen hyphen recursive which can be used uh, to compare the folders you can see here it will recursively compare any subdirectories found now i should be able to say hyphen r then retail underscore db it is the first argument retail underscore db underscore csv is the second argument to this command now you see the details so there is a file by name readme.md under retail db csv you can see the details here it did not show the contents of that file it just reported saying that this file is only in retail underscore db underscore csv then uh, it have actually gone through the rest of the folders and files and it is able to identify there is a file called as part hyphen 50s within departments in retail db as well as retail db csv it differs and you can actually see the differences as well uh, this is how you should be able to get differences between two folder structures using diff command it is quite powerful we should be able to compare code bases like this and we should be able to explore the differences and fix those differences at times we just want to know the names of the files rather than going to the details for that you can add one more control argument which is nothing but q it will only list the names with the differences instead of uh, listing the differences itself now you can see that uh, it is saying uh, retail underscore db underscore csv have readme.md but uh, not retail underscore db that's why it is saying only in retail underscore db underscore csv the file name is nothing but readme.md also instead of showing all the differences between these two files it is just saying these two differ uh, this is how you should be able to use q and uh, just get the list of files differ between the two folder structures when we use diff hyphen r it have just uh, reported all the differences considering uh, blank lines uh, white spaces and also case if you wanted to filter out those and uh, get only the real differences without considering uh, blank lines white spaces as well as uh, case then we should be able to improvise by saying diff hyphen rq then i for ignoring the case we have already uh, gone through those details while comparing the files uh, w for uh, white spaces then b for blank lines then you can hit enter we also have q that's why it is only uh, providing a brief details it is not actually showing the differences now let me remove the q let me hit enter you can see the differences between the two folders retail_db_csv 
only have readme.md the other one doesn't have also when it comes to part hyphen 50s under retail db departments and retail db csv departments ignoring case white spaces and blank lines these are the only differences this is how you should be able to get whatever differences you are looking for based on the requirements by combining multiple control arguments while using multiple control arguments you can either separate them out as we have seen earlier or we can club them for example in this case we can also use control arguments like this instead of clubbing all of these together we can actually separate these out like this so in this case i am saying diff hyphen r space hyphen i space hyphen w space hyphen capital b then the folders which we want to compare you can see the output so either you can separate the control arguments like this or you can club them like this that being said make sure you are really comfortable with diff command it comes very handy in troubleshooting data quality issues and also troubleshooting code related issues between multiple branches diff is a very powerful technique to troubleshoot issues make sure you are really comfortable with it as part of this sectional module we are going through the details related to variables and environment variables in linux in this lecture let's understand what is variable mean when it comes to any operating system or any scripting language or programming language we have something called as constants and variables first let's understand what is a constant it versity which is nothing but our company name is a constant same is the case with 0 1 etc these are numeric values it versity is of type string value however these are all constants only now you can have either it versity or analytics or some other thing as a company name uh, instead of uh, having these hard coded values we might end up creating variables variable will contain constant depending upon the context so company can be a variable name it versity can be one of the company names it versity is constant same is the case with age age can be a variable uh, it can be my age or your age my age let's say is close to 40 and uh, age can be 40 in my case in your case it can be 30 40 or 30 are literals or constants whereas age is nothing but variable now let's understand how to define variables as part of uh, linux terminals it is very straightforward if you want to create a variable by name company you just have to say company then equal you don't even need to specify single quotes for strings when it comes to linux in most of the programming languages you have to either use single quotes or double quotes while assigning a string literal to a variable when it comes to linux you don't need to do so you just have to define the value hit enter now company is created as variable same is the case with age let's say age equal to 0 now a is the variable which contain zero value in it now once the variables are created if you want to just display the value in the variable you have to use echo then dollar then followed by the variable from which you want to display the value for example you can say age it will display the value of age variable it is nothing but zero you can see the zero here it is not uh, uh, completely visible now let's say company which is another variable you should be able to see the value of the company variable here if you do not have dollar let's see what happens let's say echo greet it just displayed it have considered it as string itself however if greet is supposed to be a variable with values such as hello it can be like this there is no need to specify single quotes now i can say echo dollar greet you can see the value related to this variable once again if you do not have dollar then it will just treat greet as a string or constant value and you can see that it have printed constant value here this is how you should be able to create variables and also print them however keep in mind that you will not be able to create variables by having spaces in between in most of the programming languages as a best practice we typically specify spaces when it comes to the equal operator using which we are trying to assign a value to the variable now you see i introduced these spaces around equal and now it is considering greet as a command and it is complaining saying command greet not found did you mean command greet from deb greet so and so forth which is not right which means when it comes to defining variables in linux we should not be having spaces around equal where the literal is being assigned to a variable in this case hello is being assigned to a variable called as greet this is how you should be able to create a variable in linux variable name equal to without spaces around equal then the value which you want to assign also you should be able to have strings in single quotes or double quotes now let me say 
greet hello with uh, single quotes now let's say echo dollar greet and see how the value will be displayed you see when hello is displayed there are no single quotes around it which means whether you have single quotes or not it doesn't matter even you can replace these single quotes with double quotes let me say hello with double quotes like this then if you say echo dollar greet you can actually see the output of that variable the variable contain hello in it that being said as part of the process i try to uh, echo greet without t at the end you can see here there's no variable with that name and it didn't print anything so if there is no variable with the name that is being passed after dollar it will just print blank for example let's try one more thing here echo dollar aged where there is no variable by name aged you can see that it didn't print anything which means it is blank this is how you should be able to create variables and see the contents of the variables using echo command as part of this section of module we are going through the details related to variables and environment variables in linux at this time we are talking about environment variables we have already seen the value of environment variables in linux now let's go to the details about environment variables in windows in case if you would like to see the environment variables related to windows all you need to do is you can go to the search bar then you should be able to search for environment variables here there's a typo let me fix the typo you see here it is saying edit the system environment variables and also environment variables for your account typically we deal with system environment variables you can click on it it will take you to this now you should be able to click on this to actually review the environment variables these are the user variables these are the system variables you should be able to manipulate these things to control the behavior of the environment of the user that is logged in into this window system now this is how you should be able to access environment variables using the wizard all you need to do is you just have to go to the search bar then search for environment variables and click on this edit the system environment variables it will open the wizard you just have to click on it then you should be able to access system variables here and user variables here now you see there are quite a few environment variables so one of the important ones is nothing but path now let me cancel and cancel now let me open powershell you should be able to access the environment variables even using powershell or dos prompt in linux it is nothing but echo dollar and then you can actually specify the environment variable name or variable name you should be able to see the value of that environment variable or variable when it comes to windows the command is nothing but dollar env colon the environment variable name in this case the environment variable names can be case insensitive which means you can specify the variable names in any case it can be lower case it can be upper case or it can be even mixed case so in this case i can actually say path to get the value of environment variable by name path you can see the value related to this environment variable this is how you should be able to access environment variables in windows both by using wizards such as what we have seen earlier which is nothing but this one and also as part of the powershell or even dos prompt we should be able to use this approach to print the content of the environment variables as we got overview of environment variables let's go to the details about some of the important environment variables using linux as operating system i'll be covering quite a few environment variables such as user home path so and so forth using linux as operating system it is very very important for you to understand the relevance of all these important environment variables make sure you spend time and understand all these details as part of the sectional module we are going through the details related to variables and environment variables in linux so far we have understood the meaning of variable and also environment variable and then we have actually reviewed some of the standard environment variables such as home user name pwd etc now it is time for us to explore a very important environment variable called as path however before getting into path we need to understand from where the commands are being executed in that process we'll explore a very important command called as which which will give us the details about from where the program is being executed so far we have ran commands such as ls to list the files find to find the files mkdir to create a folder rm to remove the files or folders cp to copy the files or folders mv to move files or folders so and so forth we have executed quite a lot of commands as part of uh, this course now from where these programs are being executed to get the details about the location of these programs in linux file system we should be able to use which command so we can say which then the command name it will give us the details about where the actual command is the actual command is under slash user slash bin slash ls you can actually run ls even ltr on slash user slash bin ls and you can actually see the details 
it is executable you can see there is execute on top of user bin ls the owner of this uh, file is nothing but a root root have read write as well as execute permissions the members in the group which is again root have read and execute all others have read and execute uh, all the users such as d gadraju and any other user that is being created here will be just reading and executing using this command we will not be writing and hence write permissions are not relevant as long as we have read and execute permissions on this command we should be able to use it you can also say which find again you can say ls hyphen ltr and then user bin find you should be able to see the properties of this file even find is part of user bin find only most of the standard commands which we use on regular basis will be under user bin there might be some other commands which we have set up over a period of time which might not be part of this location it can be some other location however we will not be able to use those things directly that's where we have to update the path variable how the paths which you are seeing here is relevant to path environment variable that i'll be covering as part of the next lecture as of now make sure you understand that you can use which command to understand the location of the command that is being executed such as ls find etc then you should be able to list the properties of that file by using ls hyphen ltr like this now it is time for us to understand how it is relevant to path even though the fully qualified path for ls is this one and find is this one why they are working even when we do not specify the fully qualified path when we just say ls why it is running when we just say find why it is running we need to understand and for that uh, we need to have better understanding about a very important environment variable called as path we'll be talking about those details in subsequent lectures in this sectional module as part of this sectional module we are going to the details related to variables and environment variables in linux after going to the details about variable and environment variable we have reviewed some of the important and standard environment variables now we are actually exploring the path environment variable already we have seen how to get the location of commands that are being run in linux such as ls find etc using something called as which now we need to understand how these are relevant to path path is environment variable which is there you can actually say env then grep path you should be able to see the details about path environment variable as part of the output of env you can also get the details of path environment variable by saying echo dollar path you can see the output here now i'll be performing quite a few tasks so that you understand path in detail first i'll be actually unsetting this path environment variable for that we should be able to say unset unset is a command which is available to unset any environment variable let's say path now path is unset you can actually say echo dollar path you can see that there is no content with respect to environment variable called as path now if you try to say ls you see it is complaining saying no such file or directory think about why it is actually complaining like this i'll be covering uh, why it is complaining like this as part of the next lecture so in this lecture after going through the details about where we stand as of now we have reviewed the contents of the path environment variable we have used two approaches to review one is output of env is passed to grep with path and we can actually see the uh, value for the path environment variable and also by saying echo dollar path we are able to see the actual content of the environment variable called as path then we have unset path and then when we try to run comments such as ls find etc it is actually complaining saying no such file or directory why it is complaining like that let's go to the details as part of the next lecture as part of this sectional module we are going to the details related to variables and environment variables in linux at this time we are talking about a very important environment variable called as path before getting into the details about how to add our applications to the environment variable called as path let's focus on profile and bash rc as part of linux operating system whenever we log in into a specific session in that session the behavior is controlled by these two files one is rc second one is profile based upon the type of shell that is being used it will execute those two and it will take it further to get the details about those hidden files you can actually say ls a and hit enter you can review all the hidden files here you have something called as dot bash rc you can see here on top of it either you will be having dot bash underscore profile or profile you can see the dot profile here so dot bash rc and dot profile are the ones which will actually control the behavior of your session uh, let's review the contents of these files let me say cat dot bash rc you can see that it have a shell script it have few aliases such as ll equal to ls hyphen alf la equal to ls hyphen capital a l equal to ls hyphen capital c capital f so instead of saying ls space hyphen a l f you can actually say ll it will behave the same way as ls hyphen a l f 
let me demonstrate here i am saying ll you can see that it is actually displaying the properties of the files and also for directories it is actually showing like this it is because of the behavior of ls space hyphen alf because we have a in it we are also seeing the hidden files also now if i say l you can see that it is listing the files it is because of the command uh, that is pointing to alias l let's review once again for that i'm actually saying cat dot bash rc this will be executed when the login happens into the system using this user and whatever is there as part of this shell script all these things will be in effect in the session you can also see that i have pr provided alias for rm hyphen i as rm so that the files are not accidentally deleted that being said we also have dot profile let's review the details about dot profile if you look at dot profile it is actually executing dollar home slash dot bash rc which is nothing but the script which you have seen earlier the reason why dot bash rc is being executed is because of this logic in the dot profile if you delete the dot profile file then uh, the behavior will be altered let me demonstrate so that you understand what i'm talking about here i'm actually saying mv then uh, dot profile then i'm actually saying dot profile dot bkp so that the backup is created now the backup is created uh, the original dot profile is gone if you say cat dot profile it will say no such file or directory now let me exit now let me try logging in once again using wsl now you see the behavior is changed instead of highlighting the colors and all it is white because of the lack of dot profile so dot bash rc is not executed now let me say cd ls hyphen ltr we can actually see the details of the files and folders here but the behavior is only black and white because dot profile is not executed also let's cat dot bash rc you can see that there are quite a few aliases there is alias ll la l and also rm let's say alias rm to see if the alias is created or not you can see that it is complaining rm not found which means the alias is not available here it is because dot profile is missing we have dot profile dot backup but no dot profile as part of the dot profile we have the reference to dot bash rc only when dot bash rc is executed you will be seeing these aliases now let me say mv dot profile dot bkp then dot profile now the, the dot profile is recreated now let me exit from here then let me say wsl to get into the linux operating system here and you can see now the colors are displayed because dot profile is executed now i should be able to say alias rm this time it is working as expected let's reiterate what is going on whenever we try to log in let me exit from here let me say wsl when we try to log in into specific uh, linux based server first it will try to execute profile in this case the profile is nothing but dot profile depending upon your environment the profile name might be different whatever logic that is there as part of the dot profile will be executed automatically now let me go to the home directory let me cat dot profile as part of the dot profile it have some logic but it is actually invoking dot bash rc if it exists you can see that it is actually checking if the file exists if it exists then it is actually invoking dot bash rc if you look at the logic in dot bash rc it has several alias commands uh, to actually create aliases for ls hyphen alf as ll ls hyphen a as la so and so forth and also it have quite a few other stuff all these things will be executed which will give you the experience which you are getting when you log in so internally it is invoking profile which is invoking bash rc and based upon the logic that is there we are actually seeing the behavior of our sessions you can see that as part of dot bash rc it is also executing scripts such as bash aliases and also few other things there is also something called as bash completion under etc even those are getting executed so there will be quite a few scripts that will be executed whenever you try to log in into a specific system now why we are talking about profile and bash rc when we are talking about path you will be understanding those details by end of next few lectures first let's go ahead and create a program then we'll actually add that program to the path then we'll actually get into the details about making sure how to leverage the dot bash rc or dot profile to make this program which we are developing available across the sessions let's start with a simple program and then we'll take it further 
as part of linux commands for beginners we need to understand how to deal with multiple machines to understand how to deal with multiple machines we need to have multiple machines one of the ways to get multiple machines so that we can explore the details and commands related to dealing with multiple machines is to use cloud platforms such as aws in this section of module we'll actually go through the details about getting started with aws so that eventually we can create as many machines as we want to explore all the important linux commands at a beginner level in this section of module we'll go through the details about signing up for aws once we complete the sign up process we'll have valid aws account once we get valid aws account we'll see overview of aws web console and also we'll actually go through the details about aws ec2 console or dashboard we'll limit the discussion only to aws ec2 console or dashboard because we'll be using only ec2 to explore all important aspects related to linux commands at a beginner level uh, once we get an overview about uh, AWS EC2 console or dashboard then we'll actually take care of creating something called as EC2 key pair it is important to have EC2 key pair so that we can connect to EC2 instance without any issue when we create AWS EC2 key pair using AWS console a pem file will be downloaded we need to make sure the backup is taken for that pem file without that pem file will not be able to connect to EC2 instance once the key pair is created we'll be creating EC2 instance using the same key pair uh, which means uh, uh, we'll be able to authenticate to that EC2 instance using the pem file that is already downloaded once the EC2 instance is created with the appropriate uh, EC2 key pair we'll see how to log in into the AWS EC2 instance using the pem file then we'll actually get details about AWS free tier and also pricing then we'll also go to the details related to AWS web console cloud shell we can leverage cloud shell to actually manage the AWS services and their components once we go through all these details we'll actually spend some time in understanding some of the AWS EC2 instance concepts then we'll actually see the details related to managing AWS EC2 instances these are the things which will be talking about by the end of this section you will not only understand uh, AWS console you will also create EC2 instance and also you will terminate it once we go through these uh, steps uh, we will be proficient enough to create as many EC2 instances as we want when we actually get into the appropriate sections or modules down the line in this course to explore more and more linux commands and concepts as part of this sectional module we are going through the details related to getting started with aws from the perspective of exploring some of the basic linux commands we'll be exploring quite a few networking concepts and also the concepts related to ssh using the servers provisioned from aws we need to have multiple servers in this case we are going to use aws as the platform to provision multiple servers so that we explore some of the basics related to linux commands that being said in this lecture in the process of getting started with aws let's see how to sign up for aws Uh, to sign up for the AWS you just have to go to aws.amazon.com then you should be able to click on create an AWS account keep in mind that uh, AWS takes your credit card information you need to use your credit card information to sign up for AWS without credit card information you will not be able to sign up for AWS you can give your root user email address and then uh, specify the account name then click on verify email address you will get an email you have to uh, complete the verification process then you have to take it further uh, by registering your credit card based upon your credit card and the comfort level with respect to providing the information it might take a day or two to complete the sign up process you need to have valid aws account to make sure you provision uh, instances from aws to explore some of the basics related to linux if you don't want to use aws you can also use other cloud platforms such as gc cp azure etc all you need is some additional servers so that you can experiment around multiple virtual machines when it comes to concepts such as ssh networking concepts etc that being said once you are done with the sign up process you can log in into your aws account by again going to aws.amazon.com so let me say aws.amazon.com then you should be able to click on sign in then you should be able to use your root email and you can actually log in once the account is created for you so you have to choose root user to log in for the first time then you have to specify the email address in my case it is nothing but this one once the email address is entered you also need to enter the password let me enter the password here i have multi factor authentication and hence it will actually ask me for the authentication code in your case you might not have configured multi factor authentication at this time and hence you might not have to enter the authentication code it might be optional for you 
However, you can actually enable multi-factor authentication for additional security. Once the multi-factor authentication is done, you will start getting uh, the screen where you have to enter your authentication code. That being said, now if you see this, you can ignore by clicking on not now. You don't need to register your mobile number. Then it will actually take you to the AWS uh, web console or AWS management console. This is how you should be able to complete this sign up process and also log in for the first time. Once you log in for the first time, you have to watch here. Uh, you can check the region. The region will be selected based upon the location which you are in. The default region can be different or you might want to explore uh, by creating EC2 instances in a different region. You can select a different region by clicking on this drop down and take it further. I'll be using US East region. In your case, whatever region you want to use, you can pick it and you can take it further. As of now, we have gone through the details about how to sign up for AWS and also how to log in into the AWS uh, web console and also how to change the region so that you can leverage the region which you are interested in to experiment around learning all the important aspects with respect to Linux commands. Yes, we have successfully signed up for AWS account. Now let's spend some time in understanding AWS web console. AWS web console is nothing but this one. You can see quite a few wizards here. And there is a recently visited, then welcome to AWS, so and so forth. You can also build solutions directly using uh, relevant uh, commonly used wizards. You can launch a virtual machine, you can start a development project, you can also connect an IoT device, so and so forth. In this section, as part of getting started with AWS, we'll be primarily focusing on launching a virtual machine. We'll be taking care of rest of the stuff depending upon the relevance of it uh, in uh, other courses. That being said, one of the key thing with respect to AWS Web Console is nothing but services, then global search bar. You should be able to search for either a service or feature or blog or document or anything using this global search bar. You can also navigate through the services by clicking on services here. You can see the services are grouped into multiple categories such as analytics, application integration, so and so forth. You should be able to click on the category and you should be able to see all the services under that category. Uh, with respect to getting started, uh, we should be focused on compute. You can see the options available as part of the compute will be primarily focusing on EC2. This is how you should be able to navigate through services. You can see that the services are categorized into multiple groups. You can choose appropriate group or category and then take it further. You can also search for services such as EC2 by using this global search bar. You can see that it is actually providing the link for the EC2. We'll go through the details very soon. On top of the services, you can also see the references related to EC2 in features, blogs, documentation, knowledge articles, tutorials, events, marketplace, etc. Uh, this is how you should be able to get started with AWS Web Console on top of services uh, and also global search bar. You also have few additional things on the right side. You can actually use Cloud Terminal or Cloud Shell. You should be able to click on this. It will quickly create a Cloud Shell for you. You should be able to interact with AWS services using this uh, Cloud Shell. Uh, I will actually go through the details about Cloud Shell as part of one of the lectures in this getting started. It is very, very important for you to understand the relevance of Cloud Shell. We will see those details. Also, we have notifications. You should be able to review the notifications and access those things. You can also click on this to get help or documentation or even training. Also, you can review the regions here. We have already gone through the details about regions in the previous lecture. You can choose the region of your choice and then you can take it further. If you want to get details about billing and all, you should be able to expand this and then you should be able to click on billing dashboard. As part of the getting started, I will not be covering all the nuances related to billing dashboard. It is not that important at this time. We'll be using free tier to provision the EC2 instances. Even if you spend additional amount of time than whatever is provided by free tier, uh, as we are using uh, low configuration servers, the costs associated with those low configuration servers will be very minimal. That being said, make sure you understand how to use this AWS Web Console to get whatever you are looking for. For billing dashboard, you have to just expand your account name here and then go to billing dashboard. You can also use Cloud Shell. I'll not be covering details with respect to Cloud Shell at this time, but as part of one of the lectures in getting started, I'll be covering details with respect to Cloud Shell. Also, to access all the services, you can either go to services and go to appropriate category and access a service, or you should be able to search for a service as part of this global search bar. Also, for most of the services in AWS, we have designated console or dashboard. For example, EC2 have EC2 dashboard, IAM have IAM console, so and so forth. As we have understood AWS Web Console uh, at a higher level, now it is time for us to explore EC2 dashboard. Using EC2 dashboard, we'll also see how to create EC2 key pair and also 
our first EC2 instance, all those details will be covered as part of this sectional module across multiple lectures. That being said, let's go ahead and explore EC2 dashboard so that we can leverage it to actually provision our first instance eventually. As part of getting started with AWS, so far we have signed up for AWS and also we have gone through the details about AWS Web Console. Now it is time for us to explore AWS EC2 dashboard. To go to the EC2 dashboard, you should be able to search for EC2 here. I am using global search bar or you can also go to the services then go to the compute. EC2 is part of compute category. You should be able to click on it. It will take you to the EC2 dashboard. Let's wait until EC2 dashboard is opened. It is also known as the EC2 management console. As of now, as part of Northern Virginia region, I have seven instances running. Overall, there are 20 instances. Rest of the 13 instances are in stopped state. I have 30 volumes. Uh, then I have 11 key pairs, 56 security groups, 139 snapshots, 19 elastic IP, so and so forth. This is the high level overview about my EC2 usage. When it comes to EC2, there are quite a few components in it. The main component is nothing but instance. On top of instance, we also have volumes, snapshots, elastic IPs, security groups, key pairs, etc. At this time, as part of getting started, we will primarily focus on key pairs and instances. Then if you want to go to the instance level details, you can click on instances and you should be able to see the details related to the instances. You can see that it is showing all the instances that are there as part of my account. To go back to the original dashboard, you can click on EC2 dashboard here. Now you can see that it came back to the original dashboard. You can also click on instances running here. It will take care of filtering for running instances and you can see only running instances here. You can click on this to remove the filter. Then you should be able to see all the instances. Uh, if you are familiar about uh, AWS concepts, you can also explore others. For now, don't worry too much about it in the process of getting started with AWS. It is enough to understand the details with respect to the instances that are provisioned at this time. You might not see any instances under your account. On top of instances, another important component within EC2 you should be familiar with is nothing but key pair. So we'll be creating a key pair and we'll be using it to provision the instance and hence you can actually go to the key pairs and you should be able to review all the key pairs that are created under your account. You might not see any key pairs yet. You have to create the key pair. We'll be taking care of creating a new key pair as part of the next lecture. Also when it comes to EC2 instances, there will be volumes associated with it. We will go through the details about volumes and few other important components such as security groups once we provision the instance. That being said, as we got an overview about EC2 console or EC2 dashboard, now it is time for us to go through the details related to creating the key pair so that we can leverage that key pair to create the AWS EC2 instance. I'll be covering the details about creating the key pair as part of the next lecture. Then we'll actually take it further to provision instance using that key pair. At this time, we are actually going through the details about getting started with uh, AWS. In the process of getting started with AWS, we have seen how to sign up for AWS and also we have got uh, details related to AWS Web Console and EC2 dashboard at higher level. Now it is time for us to create EC2 key pair for SSH login. When it comes to creating the key pair, you can actually click on it uh, so that you can actually create the key pair. Uh, you can see the existing key pairs here. You can create a new key pair by clicking on create key pair. Then you should be able to give the name to the key pair. You can also register existing SSH keys as key pair. In this case, I'm actually creating a new key pair. We should be able to give the name here. Let's say GS demo, getting started demo. You can actually choose the key pair types. I'll be using RSA type. Uh, when it comes to private key file format, uh, I'm using .pem. If you want to configure using PuTTY, then you can use .ppk. We'll be using .pem. Even when we use Windows, we'll be using Linux that is set up using WSL. As part of uh, Linux based systems, we should be able to leverage .pem files and we should be able to connect to the EC2 instances that are provisioned using this key pair. In case if you wanted to use PuTTY, you can convert PEM to PPK at any point in time and then take it further. I'll be primarily focusing on connecting using Linux uh, set up using WSL on top of Windows to connect to EC2 instances uh, rather than uh, using PuTTY. That being said, make sure you choose PEM then click on create key pair. It will take care of creating the key pair for you. You can also see that the PEM file is downloaded. It is very important for you to save this PEM file in appropriate location so that you can use it to connect to EC2 instances which will be provisioned using this key pair called as JS demo. Now you should be able to refresh this. You should be able to see JS demo key pair here. 
keep in mind that you have to use this uh, key pair so that we can leverage jsdemo.pem to connect to the ec2 instance that is being provisioned it is very important for us to identify the key pair that is supposed to be used with the ec2 instance while provisioning only those ec2 instances that are provisioned using this key pair will be able to connect using this pem file pem file is nothing but private key file when we use this key pair while creating ec2 instance the corresponding public key will be copied into the home directory of standard user you will understand all those nuances when we actually provision ec2 instance and when we try to connect to that ec2 instance using this pem file for now just create a key pair and make sure you remember which key pair you wanted to use while provisioning the ec2 instance as part of the next lecture yeah, as part of getting started with aws so far we have gone through details related to signing up for aws then we have got an overview of aws web console as well as aws ec2 console or dashboard then we have created ec2 key pair the key pair name is nothing but js demo we have even downloaded the pem file which is created because of the ec2 key pair now it is time for us to launch a virtual machine using ec2 we'll be using the key pair that is created it is nothing but js demo there are multiple ways to get into the page where we can actually launch a virtual machine as part of the AWS Web Console Home under Build a Solution, you can see there is an option called as Launch a Virtual Machine. You should be able to click on it and you can actually get started with creating a EC2 instance. You can also go to EC2 dashboard or EC2 console and then you can actually launch virtual machine or EC2 instance. Uh, already you can see that uh, there is EC2 under recently visited. You can click on it to go to EC2 console which also includes EC2 dashboard. You can also search for EC2 as part of the global search bar and then uh, you can uh, click on EC2. Then it will take you to the EC2 console which includes EC2 dashboard. As part of the EC2 console by default you might get into EC2 dashboard. You can see launch instance here. You should be able to click on this and uh, get started with launching the instance. Once again if you click on launch instance here it will take you to the same page what we have seen earlier when we clicked on launch an instance as part of the AWS home page. Now you, using this page we should be able to launch the instance. We can give the name for the instance. Let me give the name as GS demo. I am giving the name as JS demo itself. In this case, I will be creating EC2 instance using Ubuntu operating system and hence let me click on Ubuntu. Uh, this is the latest uh, uh, web console. Earlier, the web console used to be a little bit different. That being said, now you should be able to choose Ubuntu 20.04 at this time ubuntu 20.04 is the most popular one recently they have even launched 22.04 in this case i'll be launching using ubuntu 20.04 let me click on it now let me scroll down make sure you choose t2.micro it is more than enough for us to get started with aws also we should be able to learn quite a lot of uh, stuff using this uh, t2.micro itself i have chosen t2.micro because it is free tier eligible it means uh, if you just started with AWS for one year, you should be able to run this instance. Only one instance can be run for one year for free, that too if you have chosen t2.micro. Other instances are not free tier eligible. Unless and until you are using your corporate account, make sure you choose free tier eligible if you just started with AWS. Then we have to choose key pair. We have created a key pair by name GS Demo. Let's choose it here. This is how you will be able to configure the key pair while creating the EC2 instance. Without key pair, you will not be able to log in into the EC2 instance. Make sure you choose the appropriate key pair here. You need to have corresponding private key file downloaded onto your Windows or Mac. Uh, in this case, uh, I have jsdemo.pem downloaded into my Mac. I'll be using as part of my Windows based system as well. Now, if you want, you can configure network settings. For now, we will just uh, choose this one, Hello SSH traffic from. It is automatically chosen. Without this, you will not be able to connect to this EC2 instance, even though the instance is created using appropriate key pair. Now let's scroll down. It is time for us to configure storage. By default, you will get up to 30 GB for free as part of the free tier. If you wanted to use more than that, then you have to pay. You have to understand the pricing and you have to be prepared to pay. As of now, by default, you will be getting 8 GB and the type of the storage which you will be getting out of the box is nothing but SSD GP2. There are also other types such as GP3, IO1 which is nothing but IOPS SSD and also IO2 which is also of type IOPS SSD. On top of these things we also have magnetic standard. You can choose the type of storage depending upon your requirement. In this case I will be increasing to 16 GB rather than 30 GB. So let me say 16 GB here. Now it will be associated with the instance that is being created. On top of these things, uh, there are also advanced details. If you want, you can explore. For now, we can ignore. These are not that important. Now, let me collapse this. Let's review the details here. 
we are trying to create one instance the operating system is nothing but ubuntu 20.04 the instance type is nothing but t2.micro as of now it is going to create a new security group if you want to configure uh, you can configure existing security group itself as part of this virtual machine when it comes to storage it is nothing but 16 gb yeah, we have reviewed all the details. We can actually click on launch instance. It will take care of creating one instance. If you wanted to create two or three instances, you can change the number here and then you can click on this button. It will take care of creating those many instances. Let's click on launch instance here. Now you can see that instance is being created. It will take some time for instance to be completely up and running. You can actually click on this. It will open in another tab or window. Now you should be able to see the details the instance state is in pending once it is running you will see the state as running once the state is changed to running we should be able to connect and we can validate whether the instance is created properly or not that being said as we have initiated the instance creation let's wait until instance state is changed to running then we will see how to connect to this ec2 instance using ssh via this pem file We'll be using this PAM file while connecting to this instance. Now you can see that the instance state is running. Now it is time for us to try connecting to this instance. I'll do that as part of the next lecture. As part of getting started with AWS, after signing up for AWS, we have successfully provisioned EC2 instance using a key pair called as JSDemo. When we actually created the key pair, we have downloaded the PEM file as well. Now using this PEM file, we should be able to connect to this EC2 instance. On top of PEM file, we also need to have either public DNS or public IP to connect to this EC2 instance. You can see the details about public IP here and also public DNS here. Either we can use public IP or public DNS to connect to this EC2 instance using this PEM file. I have already copied this PEM file into my Windows system. Uh, as part of the Windows system, it is under Downloads folder. In case if you have used the browser in your Windows system to actually create key pair and also EC2 instance, most likely the PEM file will be downloaded to Downloads folder. At times you might have configured the downloads folder to some other location in case if you couldn't find the pem file under downloads folder you need to figure out the location which you have used for downloads and you have to go to that location to find the pem file using this pem file and the public dns we should be able to connect to that ec2 instance in case if you are not seeing the details about your instance you just have to select it now you can see that there are no details related to this instance you just select it then you should be able to see the public ipv4 address here a public ipv4 dns here i typically use public ipv4 dns you can also use public ipv4 address keep in mind that the public ipv4 dns is derived from public ipv4 address only now let's go back to the windows let me open the powershell powershell already have open ssh you should be able to use open ssh in powershell to connect to this ec2 instance all you need to do is say ssh then hyphen i then downloads you can uh, hit a tab after typing few characters in downloads you can see that it have auto filled then you have to specify the pem file name which is nothing but jsdemo.pem uh, the default user with respect to ubuntu 20.04 is nothing but ubuntu that is the username which you have to pass at the rate paste the public ipv4 dns hit enter it might prompt you to say yes or no for the first time once you type yes you will be inside the ec2 instance you can see the details here this is how you should be able to connect using powershell leveraging open ssh that comes as part of powershell powershell in uh, windows 10 and windows 11 will automatically have open ssh you should be able to use it and uh, login into the ec2 instance without any issues as long as you have the pem file if you don't have the pem file then you will not be able to connect that being said if you are using mac you can open terminal then you can say ssh hyphen i home directory tilde represents home directory slash downloads as of now the pem file is under downloads folder and hence i am saying downloads then gsdemo.pem then ubuntu at the rate paste the public ipv4 dns hit enter however on mac it might fail you can see that it is complaining saying bad permissions it is because the permissions on the file has to be restricted to the owner then only it will work now let me copy paste the path of the gsdemo.pem to review the properties of this pem file i'm using lsfn ltr command you can hit enter you can see that the permissions are nothing but uh, read and write for the owner read only for members in staff read only for others in this case we have to change the permissions to 
600, which means the others should not have read permissions. Now I can actually say chmod 600 or uh, I can also say g minus r comma o minus r which means others then we should be able to paste the file name the file name is nothing but this one now it is pasted hit enter now let's say ls ltr downloads jsdemo.pem others other than the owner doesn't have any permissions now i should be able to use this command to connect to the ec2 instance this time it will work without any issues this is how you should be able to connect to the EC2 instance using the PEM file along with the public IPv4 DNS and also the user. The user is nothing but Ubuntu which is default user for Ubuntu 20.04. Also if you are not sure about this command you can actually use AWS Web Console to get the reference command and you can actually improvise on top of it to get appropriate command to connect to the EC2 instance. Let's go to the AWS console here. You can actually select the instance here click on connect you should be able to get the details related to default user and also you can go to the ssh client and you should be able to see the command for your reference by using this you should be able to connect from the downloads folder if you are using mac you need to make sure the permissions on this file are nothing but 600 even with respect to ubuntu you have to make sure the permissions are 600 or even 400 I have 600 even with 600 it will work however 400 is recommended that being said you can also go to ec2 instance connect then click on connect here it will take care of connecting to ec2 instance directly from aws console itself you can see that i am connected to the ec2 instance using aws console however keep in mind that uh, not all instances might have this feature enabled only certain types of instances with a certain operating system might have this feature that being said this is how you should be able to connect to ec2 instance once it is provisioned from aws as we have created our first ec2 instance as part of the aws account now it is time for us to understand some of the nuances related to pricing and free tier let's go to google and search for aws free tier then you should be able to click on this to get more details about free tier you can also click on this to understand more about free tier probably this might be a better bet using the aws free tier whenever you sign up for aws this is what free tier actually gives you up to 12 months your aws usage stays within the aws free tier limits for each and every service there will be free tier limits you can only use up to those limits also uh, it is eligible only for 12 months after that there is nothing free in aws unless and until you get credits from them you can also easily get aws credits if you are a startup you use only aws services that offer aws free tier benefits some of these services might not have free tier benefits you will not be able to get those services for free also keep in mind that you have configured your credit card to complete the sign up process with respect to aws account and hence if you cross free tier limits you will be charged on your credit card at times aws might waive some of the charges but they might not waive all the time that being said it is very very important for you to understand the free tier limits based upon the service you are using now we are using t2.micro instance to understand details about uh, getting started with aws you need to understand the limits related to your t2.micro instance already we have seen a notification with respect to storage you can get up to 30 gb free storage with respect to free tier around ec2 also when it comes to ec2 only t2.micro comes under free tier there will be charges associated with all other instance types that being said it is very important for you to understand how free tier works with respect to ec2 when it comes to any ec2 instance there are different states the states are nothing but running also you can select the ec2 instance here then expand instance state on top of running you also have stop state hibernate and terminate if it is terminated or stopped you will not be charged otherwise you will be charged even under free tier the number of hours will not be counted if the instance is in stopped state if the instance is in up and running state then your free tier hours will be counted uh, that being said in a month with 31 days at max you will be having 744 hours for 744 hours you will be able to keep this instance up and running without any issue however if you want to run two instances you need to make sure that combined they should not exceed 744 hours if uh, they exceed 744 hours in a 31 day month you will end up paying for both the instances whatever hours that are counted beyond free tier based on those hours you will be charged so keep these things in mind and make sure you avoid unnecessary charges by shutting down your servers that are not in use 
on top of the free tier you should also be familiar about pricing one of the ways to get better understanding about pricing is nothing but pricing calculator you can actually search for aws pricing calculator in this case we are talking about ec2 for each and every service you should be able to use this pricing calculator and uh, come up with pricing with respect to ec2 you just have to click on create estimate once you are in a pricing calculator then you have to search for the ec2 here you can actually click on configure now you have to choose the region sometimes uh, the charges will differ based on the region also you can give a description here then you can actually choose the region in this case i am going to use uh, east north virginia this is the one which i am going to use let me click on change region you can choose the operating system on top of compute sometimes there will be costs associated with the software such as operating system as well we have used ubuntu ubuntu comes for free if you are using red hat or windows you might end up paying for operating system there will be some additional charges now you can actually enter minimum requirements for each instance let's say you want to use 10 instances here you are talking about only one instance then you have to increase the quantity here if you want to consider 10 instances you can actually go with vcpus and memory and also you should be able to search instances by name in this case it is instances by resources here it is instances by name you can see by default it have chosen t4g.x large in case if you want to change you can change in this case we are talking about t2.micro so we can search for t2.micro or we can select t2.micro from this drop down then you can actually specify the number of instances what will be the utilization of each instance will it be 100% or something else you can also configure hours per day or hours per month so let's say i would like to use these instances for 100 hours per month let's say i would like to use three instances now you should be able to see the details related to charges automatically the charges will be displayed here for three instances for 100 hours each we are going to pay 24 dollars 77 cents so in this case this is 100 hours per month can be per instance let's change it to one and see if the cost will differ you can see that with one instance it is only eight dollar 26 uh, cents whereas with uh, three instances it is nothing but 24 dollars 77 cents this is how you should be able to come up with the estimate for the services that are being used as part of your pursuit in understanding aws it is very important to understand this is just an estimate the final cost might vary the final cost will vary depending upon the usage of your services and also depending upon other additional charges such as data transfer etc make sure you understand the relevance of free tier and also be comfortable with the pricing calculator to get an estimate also configure alerts and notifications uh, as part of the billing so that you are notified if certain thresholds are met that being said this is how you should be able to get started with free tier and pricing as you go along and start using more and more services in aws you should be comfortable with both free tier as well as pricing as of now for getting started this is more than enough from the perspective of ec2 instances as part of getting started with AWS, so far we have successfully provisioned T2.micro instance using uh, Ubuntu 20.04 operating system. Now, let's understand how to get the details about the instances that are being provisioned from AWS using a very important tool called as Cloud Shell. Uh, to launch Cloud Shell, you just have to click on it. It will take care of launching the Cloud Shell for you. It will use uh, a Docker container under the hood and you should be able to access all the services and their components in AWS using Cloud Shell. Cloud Shell automatically provide you quite a lot of stuff. Let me actually close this. Let me go to the EC2 console homepage here. Let me click on this. Let's see the pop-up to see what all uh, features you will get using AWS Cloud Shell. You will have quite a lot of pre-installed tools such as AWS CLI, Python, Node.js and more. Also, there is 1 GB of free storage per AWS region. The files will be saved in your home directory and they will be available in future sessions for the same AWS region. So within each AWS region, there will be a home directory associated with your cloud shell. Uh, you should be able to access those files across the sessions within the same AWS region. Uh, you can click on do not show again if you don't want to see this pop up again and then click on close now it is launched without any issues however the font is not big let me see if i will be able to zoom in uh, let me actually say large confirm now you can see the uh, text in bigger size you can actually see that it already have python 
the python versions uh, it contain are nothing but python 2.7 and python 3.7 you should be able to launch python cli also as part of uh, python cli you should be able to use boto3 as well boto3 is a python based uh, aws sdk to interact with aws services not only python but also libraries such as boto3 are actually pre-installed on these machines now we can say exit and come out of it now i came out of it uh, on top of uh, uh, python and boto3 it also have AWS CLI, you can see here. As AWS CLI is pre-installed, it is not throwing error saying command not found. Instead, it is actually saying the command is not used properly after showing the usage. You can actually get the help of AWS CLI by saying AWS help. You can see the help related to the AWS CLI. Now, we have already provisioned one EC2 instance, which is of type t2.micro. Let's open that instance. In this case, I'm searching for EC2. Let me open in a new tab. Now it is being opened in a new tab. You can see the EC2 instance which we have provisioned earlier. You have the instance ID. You can copy it. Under AWS main command, there is a subcommand called as EC2. You can say help to get the help on AWS EC2. Now to get details about a given instance, we have command called as describe instance. Let's go to the command describe instance by just hitting space. You can see the describe instances. Let's see if there is a command by name describe instance. I think there is no command by name describe instance. There is only a command by name describe instances. Now let's come out of it. Then say AWS EC2 describe hyphen instances, then help. You should be able to get help of subcommands under AWS EC2 using this approach. The syntax is nothing but AWS then the service, then the subcommand related to that service, then help to get the help on describe instances under EC2. You can see the details here. You can pass the instance ID and you should be able to describe the instance using the instance ID. You can pass multiple instance IDs as well. As of now, I'll be passing only one instance ID. Now I can actually say AWS EC2 describe instances. The way you can pass the instance IDs is by using this approach we just have to say hyphen hyphen instance ids then we have to specify comma separated instance ids as of now i'll be specifying only one instance id let's copy this paste then hit enter you should be able to see the details about uh, the instances that are passed here under instance ids as of now we have passed only one instance id you should be able to see details about this instance here this is how you can get started with cloud shell Cloud Shell facilitates you to manage the services and components of the services in ad hoc manner. In earlier days, we used to have EC2 instance uh, and we used to call it as Bastion server. Now there's no need to have Bastion server for regular ad hoc tasks. You should be able to leverage Cloud Shell under your account and you should be able to maintain services and their components. Make sure you are really comfortable with Cloud Shell. It will actually facilitate you to streamline the process of uh, managing the services and their components in AWS. As part of getting started with AWS, so far we have provisioned EC2 instance and also we have seen how to connect using PEM file belonging to the key pair that is used while creating the EC2 instance. Now let's understand some of the key concepts related to AWS EC2 instances. When it comes to AWS, it is nothing but a cloud platform. There are multiple data centers in multiple regions related to the AWS cloud platform. In this case, we have used Northern Virginia region, which means data center in that northern virginia region have servers and we have provisioned ec2 instance from those servers let's say north virginia it is the region from which we have provisioned the ec2 instance so there will be a data center there will be n number of data centers in this region you can consider this as one data center as part of this data center there will be quite a lot of physical servers so this can be one physical server this can be another physical server this can be another physical server this can be another physical server. Like this, there can be n number of physical servers in a given data center within North Virginia region. Keep in mind that there might be more than one data centers in a given region. Each data center might have so many physical servers. In this case, I'm representing four physical servers. As part of getting started so far, we have created one EC2 instance of type t2.micro. You should be able to search for details related to t2.micro by saying t2.micro in Google then you should be able to get the details. So let's click on Amazon EC2 instance types. In this, you should be able to search for t2.micro. You get 1GB memory, 1 vCPU. When it comes to the storage, 
8 GB is default, but we have increased it to 16 GB. You can get the storage details by clicking on storage here. You can see 16 GB storage associated with this instance or virtual machine. So in this case, a virtual machine is created as part of these physical servers whenever we provision instance in EC2. So you can visualize something like this. So out of a huge physical server, a small virtual machine is created. Let's represent virtual machine like this. In this case, I'm naming it as GS demo. Let me specify the name here. Keep in mind that we have created this virtual machine using Ubuntu 20.04 operating system. When we actually provision the virtual machine, it will also create an user. The username is nothing but uh, Ubuntu. There'll be home directory for that Ubuntu in the file system of this virtual machine. So let me drag and drop a text box here. The home directory for user Ubuntu is nothing but slash home slash Ubuntu. It will have hidden folder by name dot SSH. This will be automatically be created. Also, when we have created this uh, EC2 instance or virtual machine, we have used gsdemo as the key pair. We have already downloaded gsdemo.pem onto our uh, system. So this is nothing but our PC. Let me say my PC. In this uh, under downloads folder, we have gsdemo.pem. So let's say gsdemo.pem. It is automatically downloaded when we have actually created the key pair. As the EC2 instance is created using gsdemo key pair, the public key associated with that key pair will be copied to something called as authorized keys under .sh folder. So there will be a file by name authorized keys under .sh that will contain the public key associated with gsdemo key pair. The file name is nothing but authorized underscore keys. You can actually go into the EC2 instance. We have already logged in into the EC2 instance. Now we can say cd.sh to get into the SSH hidden folder. Then run ls-ltr. You can see authorized keys file here. Yeah, this EC2 instance is created using gsdemo key pair. The public key of the gsdemo will be copied into this authorized keys. As the authorized keys contain the public key of the gsdemo, using gsdemo private key, which is nothing but the pem file, we'll be able to connect to this EC2 instance without any issue. This is what happens when we actually provision EC2 instance from AWS. There will be a virtual machine on top of uh, physical servers in one of the data centers in AWS. That virtual machine will also have the operating system along with the file system. As part of the file system, there will be a hidden folder by name .ssh. It will contain authorized keys. The public key associated with the key pair will be part of authorized keys uh, under .ssh in the virtual machine. The private key is already downloaded onto our PC. Using the combination of private key and the public key in authorized keys, will be able to authenticate to this virtual machine. The capacity of the virtual machine is determined by the instance type and the storage that is used while creating the virtual machine. The instance type that is used to create this virtual machine is nothing but t2.micro. You should always be able to get the details by googling around that instance type. When it comes to t2.micro, we get 1 GB of memory, 1 vCPU. Also, when it comes to the storage, we have created this using 16 GB storage. As part of getting started with AWS, so far we have gone through the details about creating EC2 instance using AWS Web Console. Uh, you can see that the EC2 instance is up and running at this time. In this lecture, let's go through the details about different instance states and also let's understand how to stop or terminate this EC2 instance. When it comes to different states associated with uh, EC2 instance, you can just select the EC2 instance, then click on drop down called as instance state. You can stop the instance, you can reboot the instance, you can also terminate the instance. In case if you wanted to use this EC2 instance for learning purposes over a period of time, you can reduce the cost by stopping the EC2 instance as and when it is not required. To stop, you just have to select the appropriate EC2 instance and then click on stop instance. It will take care of stopping the instance for you. As long as the instance is stopped, you will not be charged for the instance type. However, the storage, which is nothing but 16 GB, you will be charged for that as long as the instance is in either stopped or in running state. That being said, as of now, the instance is in a stopped state. If you want to start the instance, again, you can actually select the instance and then go to instance state. Then you can actually click on start instance. Keep in mind that when you actually stop the instance, the public IPv4 DNS will be gone and a new public IPv4 DNS will be assigned when you actually start the instance again. 
you might not be able to connect to the same EC2 instance using the same public IPv4 DNS which you have used earlier. Let's review whether the public IPv4 DNS is changed or not. Earlier I have used this command to connect to this EC2 instance. The public IPv4 DNS is nothing but 54.196.152.66. Now if I go back to the EC2 console, you can see that the public IPv4 DNS is changed. You have to select this, then go to details then click on this one then the public ipv4 dns is copied into the buffer now we should be able to say ssh i tilde slash downloads then gsdemo.pem then ubuntu at the rate paste the public ipv4 dns now you, you will be able to connect to this instance using this new public ipv4 dns the reason why public ipv4 dns is changed is because we have stopped and started the ec2 instance so when you stop and start to use it again you have to use different public IPv4 DNS associated with this instance. Uh, you can also use a concept of elastic IP to make sure the public IPv4 DNSs are not changed. However, there are costs associated with uh, uh, elastic IPs. That being said, you can actually terminate this instance as well. As long as the instance is in uh, stopped state or running state, you should be able to select the instance and you should be able to click on terminate instance. When you actually click on uh, terminate instance, it will terminate the instance completely. Whatever work you have done so far in this EC2 instance will be gone. You will not be able to reclaim unless you have the backup of the volume. Now, most likely the volume will be gone. As the volume is gone, all the work that is performed with this EC2 instance is gone. This is how you should be able to manage the cycle of the EC2 instances. If you wanted to use the same EC2 instance for a period of time and if you don't want to get charged whenever you don't use it for your learning purpose, you can keep your EC2 instance in stopped state. You can start it again whenever it is required. You can use it as long as you want and then again you can stop. If you don't want to use EC2 instance anymore, it is better to terminate it completely so that you will not be charged for anything. You can also confirm whether the storage is gone or not not by clicking on volumes once the instance is terminated. Sometimes the volumes might st still stay. To make sure the volumes are gone, you can review the volumes by going to the volume section. This is how you should be able to manage the EC2 instances as part of your AWS account. As part of this sectional model, we are in the process of getting value of SSH to interact with remote servers. I would like to have at least two EC2 instances to explore all the key concepts related to SSH. Uh, to create two EC2 instances, you can go to the AWS EC2 console, then click on launch instance. Click on launch instance. I'll be creating instances of type Ubuntu 20.04, which means both the instances will have Ubuntu 20.04 operating system. Let's say GS demo or getting started demo. Let's choose Ubuntu here. Make sure we select Ubuntu 20.04 operating system. When it comes to instance type, we can use t2.micro. When it comes to key pair, it is nothing but JS demo. For network, you can leave this. You don't need to add anything else. Then when it comes to storage, I'll be using 12 GB storage. If you look at this message, it says free tier eligible customers can get up to 30 GB of EBS general purpose or magnetic storage. In this case, we are saying 12 GB. As we are trying to create two instances, we'll be using 24 GB storage. If you use 16 GB or 18 GB, it will end up in the range of 32 GB to 36 GB. Then you have to pay for that extra storage. In this case, just to avoid additional costs, I am just using 12 GB here. Make sure the overall storage doesn't cross 30 GB. Also make sure you terminate the earlier instance which you have created as part of getting started. Now you can increase the number of instances to 2 here. You can review the details. We are trying to create 2 instances with Ubuntu 20.04 operating system. The server type is nothing but t2.micro which is free tier eligible. I am actually creating new security group. You can also use the existing security group. Then when it comes to the storage volume, for each instance we are actually considering 12 GB storage. Now you should be able to click on launch instance. It will take care of creating both the instances for us. Let's wait and see the details here. You can see there are two links here. These two links are related to two instances. As we have seen earlier, you should be able to launch Cloud Shell. Let's launch Cloud Shell here. Then you should be able to get details about these two instances by using instance ID using describe instances command. Now let me actually go to the AWS Cloud Shell. 
it is still coming up let's wait until it comes up then we'll take it further also as we have created these ec2 instances using uh, gs demo key pair leveraging the pem file that is downloaded when we created that key pair we should be able to connect to these ec2 instances without any issues however we need to get the public ipv4 dns information to connect to those instances using that pem file still cloud shell is coming up let's wait until it comes up then we will take it further now you can see that cloud shell is started we should be able to copy this uh, id this is nothing but instance id now you can say aws ec2 describe instances then hyphen hyphen instance ids you can specify both the instance ids uh, comma separated like this let me give this instance id as well there's a closing bracket at the end i need to make sure it is removed let me remove the closing bracket now let me hit enter okay the syntax is not like this probably i might have to use spaces yeah with the spaces it is working this is related to the first instance which is nothing but this one you can see here now this is related to the second instance you can see a different instance id here this is how you should be able to get the details of these instances using uh, cli as part of the cloud shell that being said you can also connect to these instances via ssh by uh, getting the appropriate public ipv4 dns for these instances you can select this and then you should be able to click on this to copy public ipv4 dns into buffer then you should be able to go to the terminal then say ssh hyphen i tilde slash downloads that is the location where i have the pem file then gsdemo.pem then ubuntu is the operating system at the rate paste the public ip4 dns now you can see that it is trying to connect to the ec2 instance now it is connected to the ec2 instance this is the first one let's get the second one as well the second one uh, is nothing but uh, this one now we should be able to select this click on this to copy the public ip before dns we should be able to go here then say ssh hyphen i tilde slash downloads then gsdemo.pem then ubuntu at the rate paste the public ip before dns hit enter say yes now you are connected to the second instance as well this is how you should be able to create multiple instances and also validate whether you are able to connect to them or not make sure you create at least two to actually go through all the details related to ssh which will be covered as part of this sectional module also you can come out of this virtual machine by saying exit as part of this sectional module we are going through details related to oru of ssh to interact with remote servers already we have created two ec2 instances and also we have validated by using ssh we are using a mode called as passwordless login in this case we are not prompted for any password you can hit enter you can see that i am able to connect to one of the ec2 instances without entering any password this is called as passwordless login now if i exit from here and then if i remove the pem file it will prompt for the password now let's try running this command without uh, reference to the pem file let's see what happens it is complaining permission denied it is not prompting for the password there is a reason why it is not prompting for the password and directly saying permission denied because as part of the server the password login is disabled password login is the least secure way of logging in into the remote servers by default as part of the ec2 instances in aws password lo login is disabled only passwordless login is enabled that is why it is very important for us to have the key pair while creating ec2 instances in aws without key pair if you try to create ec2 instance you can create but you will not be able to log in directly Uh, there will be issues uh, logging in into those ec2 instances if you wanted to log in into those ec2 instances it is uh, mandatory to actually uh, use key pair and also you need to make sure the pem file is downloaded for that key pair that is being used while creating the ec2 instances that being said the two modes that are available with respect to ssh are nothing but password login and passwordless login by default all the ec2 instances come with passwordless login how to confirm whether password login is enabled or disabled for that we have to review the ssh properties we'll go through those details as part of subsequent lectures in this sectional module 
as part of this sectional module, we are going through details related to value of SSH to interact with remote servers. So far, we have created multiple AWS EC2 instances, and also we have gone through the details related to different modes of SSH login to remote servers. Now, it is important for us to understand passwordless login to remote server. Already, I have covered these details as part of getting started with AWS. I'll be reiterating the same here. For that, I'll be using the Lucid diagram, which I have created earlier. This Lucid diagram only represents one virtual machine. As of now, we have two virtual machines with JS demo as part of the name. And hence, we can actually update this diagram like this. Now we have two virtual machines. We can separate these things as JS demo one and JS demo two. Also keep in mind that we have used JS demo key pair while creating these virtual machines. We already have the PEM file downloaded onto our PC. As part of the authorized keys in these virtual machines, the public key part of JS demo will be added. As authorized keys contain the public key, we'll be able to connect to these virtual machines using JS demo private key. Instead of JS demo private key, if you try to use any other private key, it will not work. Now let me go back here. I also have additional uh, private keys on my machine. You can see that I have attempted to connect to this uh, virtual machine or EC2 instance using itvdemo.pem under .sh. Earlier, I have used the one which is gsdemo.pem under downloads and I am able to connect. But when I try to connect to the same virtual machine or EC2 instance using the same user but different PEM file, it is saying permission denied. Because the public key that is there as part of the authorized keys is not uh, relevant to this private key. The private key and the public key should be compatible. Both should belong to same key pair. That is why with jsdemo.pem it is working, whereas with the itvdemo.pem it is not working. Also, when we try to connect to these virtual machines without uh, passing the PEM file, it is not attempting to connect to uh, those EC2 instances with password because password login is disabled. Only passwordless login is enabled. When we use passwordless login, we have to pass appropriate uh, private key files. If not, the login will not be succeeding. Uh, make sure you understand these concepts and make sure you use appropriate private key file to connect to the EC2 instances without any gaps. Even though I am demonstrating using EC2 instances, these concepts are applicable with any remote servers, not just EC2 instances. However, the PEM file names might be represented in a different way. Instead of saying PEM file, they might say private key file or something else. That being said, as we have understood the process of uh, passwordless login to remote server, now it is time for us to get an overview of SSH daemons and configuration files. Those details will be covered as part of the next lecture. As part of this sectional model, we are going through the details related to OREO of SSH to interact with remote servers. So far, we have created multiple AWS EC2 instances and also we have understood different modes of SSH login. Then we have actually gone through the details about understanding passwordless login to remote servers. All this being demonstrated using AWS, but you should be able to provision virtual machines from other cloud platforms or you can also have your own virtual machines. That being said, as part of this lecture, let's get OREO of SSH daemons and configuration files. to make sure we can connect to remote machines. On the remote machine, there has to be a SSH daemon running. Without SSH daemon, it will not work. So in this case, if I go back to this uh, Lucid diagram, on these virtual machines, JS demo 1 and JS demo 2, there will be SSH daemon process that will be running. Without that daemon process, you will not be able to do SSH onto that machine. So it will be something like this. SHD, D stands for daemon. It will be there on all these virtual machines. Without the SSH daemon running on these virtual machines, you will not be able to connect to these virtual machines. How to get the details of those virtual machines? Further, first we need to connect to that virtual machine and run certain commands. In this case, I'm actually getting into one of the virtual machines. Let me use this command. This is the public IP for DNS. This is the username. This is the PEM file related to the key pair using which this EC2 instance is provisioned. Now you can see that I'm inside the EC2 instance or virtual machine uh, which have Ubuntu operating system in it. Now the user that is used to login is nothing but Ubuntu. Ubuntu is nothing but super user in this machine. You can actually say sudo su root to switch to root user. Root is nothing but super admin as part of Linux based operating systems. Once you connected to a particular system as root, you should be able to monitor everything on the system. Also, you should be able to access all the files on the system. Now, to understand the daemon process that is associated with SSH, you can actually say service, then SSHD status. 
there should be a process by name SHD which might be up and running all the time. You can see that it is up and running. The status is running. You can also see few additional details with respect to SSHD here. Now let me come out of this. So this is the daemon process which will be running all the time on these Ubuntu based virtual machines. Without this process being running, you will not be able to connect to this EC2 instance. Let's experiment here. In this case, once we log in as root, we can say service SSHD stop. So in this case, I'm stopping the SSHD process itself. Now hit enter. As I'm already connected to it, it will not impact the existing session. However, if I open another session, let me say duplicate tab. Let me get the public IPv4 DNS associated with that EC2 instance. Let me go back to the AWS console. This is the one which I'm talking about. Let me copy this. Let me go here. Let me say SSH hyphen I tilde slash downloads. Then gsdemo.pem if you are using Windows just say downloads then slash then whatever pem file name you have. Then you can say Ubuntu yet paste the public IPv4 DNS here. Hit enter. You see it is not connecting. It is because the SSH process is stopped at this time. Let's make sure that we are actually using the same public uh, IPv4 DNS. You can see here and also you can see here. It is just hung. You can also validate whether SSH process is uh, available at this time on this machine from the PC which is nothing but my PC by using a very important command called as telnet. Then you have to specify the public IPv4 DNS of that instance or if you are using your own servers you might have public uh, IP address you can use that public IP address. Typically SSH runs on a, a special port called as 22 and hence we can actually specify 22 here and hit enter. You can see that it is not working. It is just hung because the SSHD process is stopped at this time in this session. Now let me kill it. Let me go back to this session. Let me say service SSHD status. You can see that it is in stopped state. Now to start to come out of this you can hit control C. You can see that you came out of it. Now you should be able to change this to start. Now SSHD is being started. You can validate by saying status again. You can see that it is up and running. Now you can actually go to the other tab. Then you can run telnet command first. You can see that instead of hanging the way it was hanging earlier, it is able to listen to port 22 using this public IP for DNS. Even though it is hung, it is actually printing this information. Now you should be able to hit control and closing square bracket. Then quit. You came out of telnet now. Now you should be able to use SSH command without any issue. You will be able to connect to that remote machine. You can see that now it is successfully connected. Keep in mind that the reason why the session is still active is because I haven't exited from here. After stopping, if I have exited from here, I will not be able to connect to the machine anymore. You might have to restart and as part of the restart, SSH process might come up. Once SSH process comes up, you should be able to connect without any issues. So make sure you don't come out of this session. In case if you accidentally come out of this session and if you are not able to connect to the machine because the SSH being down, you just have to restart your EC2 instance. Then you should be able to log in without any issue. That being said, as we have gone through the details related to the daemon process, it is also important for us to understand the location where the SSH configuration files are and also we'll review some of the important uh, properties. Let's go through the details related to SSH properties files as well as the SSH properties as part of the next lecture. As part of this section module, we are going through the details related to ORI of SSH to interact with the remote servers. After provisioning multiple EC2 instances, we have gone through details related to different modes of SSH login and also we have understood passwordless login. Also, as part of the previous lecture, we have gone through the details about SSH daemons on these remote servers. Now, it is time for us to review the properties files as well as properties associated with SSH. For any software that is installed on Linux, typically the properties files will be under slash etc location. So, in this case, we can actually say cd slash etc. Then, we can actually say ls ltr grep ssh to get the locations related to ssh files. Under etc, you can see there is a folder called as ssh. We should be able to get into that folder. Now let's say ls ltr. You can see there are a bunch of folders and files. In this case, we have to focus on sshd underscore config to actually control the behavior of the daemon process that are running on this machine. So you can uh, review the sshd underscore config file by saying view 
then sshd underscore config make sure not to open these files using vi if you are not comfortable uh, view will open this file in read only mode hence you will not be able to make any mistakes i'll always use view to review any of the properties files unless and until i have to update those that being said using view i am actually opening this shd underscore config file now the file is open you can actually go through the contents of the file most of the entries are commented out if you have hash at the beginning it means it is commented out uh, this is not commented which means it will be executing this as and when we try to restart or manage the ssh daemon process if you want you can actually review this file as well however it is not important to get into this file then you have several properties which are commented out all those are nothing but defaults for example in this case when it comes to port it says 22 it is commented out unless or until it is uncommented and updated the default port will be used that's why when we try to validate earlier as part of the previous lecture using telnet we end up specifying 22 it didn't work earlier when uh, sshd was stopped but when sshd is started it started working again the reason why it is working with port number 22 is because sshd is configured with 22 as the port number that being said there are other properties also you can review all these if you want you can explore and try to understand in this case if you recollect when we try to connect to this machine without uh, any keys it is not working it is just complaining saying permission denied it should have prompted uh, us for the password but it haven't prompted for the password because password lo login is disabled you can review the details as part of the uh, properties file for that i'm logging in into the virtual machine once again or ec2 instance once again now let me switch to root user now let me go to etc ssh then let me say lsf and ltr the properties file is nothing but shd underscore config now we can actually scroll down this should be an entry related to password authentication you can see the password authentication is explicitly disabled by default it is enabled if i comment this out and restart it will enable the password login but as of now they have uncommented and they have said no which means password authentication is disabled that is why when we try to connect to this machine without a private key file it is complaining we will see how to enable password login as part of the next lecture just to make sure that you understand the ways to connect to the uh, remote machines using both the modes password mode as well as passwordless mode that being said as we have understood the relevant properties files and also the daemon process associated with the ssh now it is time for us to enable password login just to experiment we'll take care of that as part of the next lecture at this time we are going through the details about overview of ssh to interact with remote servers so far we have provisioned a couple of instances and also we have gone through the details about ssh daemons as well as properties files daemons are nothing but background process that will be running all the time which will facilitate us to perform certain tasks in this case ssh daemons are the ones which will facilitate us to connect to those remote servers if ssh daemons or background process are down we'll not be able to connect to those servers as of now the password login is disabled on these remote machines let's see how to enable password login the steps that are involved to make any changes to the ssh properties files are nothing but you can update the properties file then you have to bounce the ssh process only then the changes will be in effect otherwise the changes will not be affected it is not only with respect to ssh any process where you want to customize the behavior if we have to update the properties file most of the time we have to restart the process as well that being said now let me exit from here let me try to connect using password login where i am not specifying any pem file here however it is complaining saying permission denied you can see that i am not able to connect to this machine after making the change after bouncing the ssh daemon process when we try to run this command it should prompt for the password now let me connect to the ec2 instance or virtual machine using the private key file the private key file is nothing but jsdemo.pem now i am connected now let me go to the root account let me go to etc ssh we need to open file called as sshd underscore config in this case i am using vi not view because i want to make the change if you are not comfortable with vi editor you can actually use nano editor or you can also use tools like uh, notepad plus plus by uh, reading these via remote servers leveraging win scp there are multiple ways where you can actually use ids such as notepad plus plus to 
manipulate these files but you can actually try with nano editor if you are not comfortable with, with the VA editor in this case I am using VA editor in the worst case you will not be able to connect to the server in case if you are not able to connect to the server you just uh, terminate the instance and start a new instance and take it further that being said now I should be able to open sshd underscore config now we can actually go to the location where we have the password authentication yeah they have gone here before it have actually opened in that location however it will be somewhere in the middle of the file you just uh, go down using down arrow for the entry where we have the password authentication now we can go to the beginning of this and comment it out it should enable the password login however we need to bounce it or we can explicitly remove no and then replace it with yes I am using VA editor. I have deleted using VA commands. Now I am saying yes. Now it is updated with VA editor. I can actually write and come out of it by saying colon X in escape mode. Now the changes are persisted. You can actually say grep, then password, then sshd underscore config to review the value related to that entry. You can see that now it is changed to yes. As it is changed to yes, we should be able to connect to this via password. However, the user should have the password as well. When it comes to Ubuntu user, there should be a password associated with it. Then only I'll be able to validate with appropriate password. However, if I exit and then exit again to come back to my Mac and if I run this command without any PEM file, it will still complain. It is due to the fact that even though password authentication is updated as part of the properties file, SSH daemon process is not bounced. Now let me log in using the PEM file. Let me go to root account by saying sudo su root. Now let me say service then sshd restart. It will take care of restarting the uh, SSH daemon process. You can validate whether it is up and running or not by saying status. You can see that it is up and running. Now I can come out of it. Exit. Then exit. Now let me try running this command. It should prompt for the password. You can see that it is prompting for the password. But we haven't set up any password for this user. And hence we will not be able to log in. It will just complain. Now we have to set the password for this user. For that I am actually using PEM file. So that I can log in without entering the password. It will use the key pair to actually connect to that instance. Once you are in the instance for whatever user you want to connect with, with the password, you have to set the password. For that you can use command called as passwd. Then Ubuntu, Ubuntu is optional. You don't need to specify Ubuntu because you are already logged in as that user. Now you can hit enter. Hit enter for current password because we don't have any password. However, it is complaining. So as Ubuntu user, you will not be able to reset the password. To reset the password, you can actually say sudo then pass wd ubuntu you are using super user permissions of ubuntu user to reset the password when you use sudo it will not prompt for the existing password it will just prompt for the new password now you can actually give the new password now i have entered the new password you can see that it has said password updated successfully let me come out of it now let me run this without pem file it will prompt for the password I have to enter the password which I have set earlier. Once the right password is entered, we are able to connect. Which means I am able to enable password login on this machine. Now let's take it as an exercise and make sure the password login is enabled even on the other server. I have demonstrated on one server. I will let you take care of it on the other server. Keep the steps in mind. First you have to go to the system and then you have to sudo as root. Once you are logged in as root, then you have to open the appropriate properties file which is under slash etc slash ssh folder. Then you have to make sure the line which says password authentication no is replaced with password authentication yes. You have to bounce the ssh daemon process or background process and also you have to set the password for Ubuntu so that you can actually log in into that machine using Ubuntu user with appropriate password. 
As part of this section module, we are going through the details related to value of SSH to interact with remote servers. So far, we have provisioned two servers from AWS and also we have gone through the details related to SSH concepts such as SSH daemons or background process and also the SSH properties. Also, to make sure we understand the relevance of SSH properties files, we have enabled password login on both the instances. I have demonstrated using one instance and I have left the other instance for your exercise. That being said, one of the key features with respect to SSH is not only to connected to the remote machine but also to run the commands on the remote machine directly. For example, let's say I would like to connect to the remote machines and run hostname command to get the fully qualified name of that uh, remote machine. One of the ways is to use the approach of SSH like this where we are actually connecting to the remote machine without password. Now I am in the remote machine. Once I am in the remote machine, I should be able to run hostname hyphen f to actually get the fully qualified uh, name of this host. In the similar manner, let's say I would like to validate whether a particular daemon process is up and running on these remote machines. Even we have to use commands such as sudo, then service, then let's say sshd status. You should be able to check the status of sshd process on the remote machine. However, you are in the remote machine already. Now, every time you have to get into the remote machine, run the command and then you have to exit from here to go back to your machine. Many times you have to deal with n number of servers. Instead of logging in into the remote machines, running the commands and exiting from there, you can actually run the commands remotely using SSH. Let's see how we can take care of running such commands on remote machines without logging in into the remote machines themselves. You have to still use SSH command. You can leverage this. Now you should be able to specify the command you want to run in double quotes like this. Let's say you want to run hostname hyphen f. You can say hostname hyphen f like this. It will connect you to the remote machine, just run the hostname hyphen f, display the output and come out of that to your uh, PC or Mac. In this case, the control is back in the Mac. I don't need to say exit again to come back to the Mac. It automatically came back to the Mac. Now, I have ran hostname hyphen f on this uh, EC2 instance or remote machine. Now, let's try to run the similar command on other EC2 instance or remote machine. You can see that I am saying hostname hyphen f in double quotes and you can see that it have executed that command and you can see the output here. This is a different EC2 instance than this. You can also run commands such as sudo service sshd status to check if sshd process is running appropriately or not. It will just connect to that remote machine, execute that command, display the output and you can see that the control came back to the Mac or if you are using Windows, the control will come back to the Windows. This is how you should be able to run the commands on remote machines. Using this approach, you can even automate certain things to validate on remote machines on regular basis. This is a very powerful mechanism and hence make sure you are comfortable with it. Many times you might have to troubleshoot the issues. Also, you might want to see what is the free memory on the uh, servers. Also, you might want to check the storage level details. All those commands can run using SSH remotely using this approach. Let's say I would like to see how much free memory is there on both the EC2 instances that are provisioned from uh, AWS. I can say free hyphen H like this. This will give the details about this EC2 instance or virtual machine. As of now, the available memory is nothing but 65 megabytes. Now, I can also run the same command on other EC2 instance. The other EC2 instance is nothing but this one. So let me say free hyphen H. I should be able to see the details related to the memory for this instance. I can also improvise on top of it. For example, let's say I would like to get only the available details. For that, I can split by space and get the last column information using awk. The logic will look like this. I can say awk hyphen f, then space is the delimiter, then I can actually say print dollar $nf. $nf stands for number of fields. By saying dollar $nf, we'll be getting the last entry details. Now I should be able to hit enter. Let's see whether we'll be getting the details we are looking for or not. You can see the available memory. We are able to get 671 MB for it. Uh, with respect to swap also, it have given these details, which is not right, but it's okay for now. 
this is how you should be able to run commands on the remote servers leveraging or using SSH. You just have to say SSH, which you typically use to connect to the remote machine. After that SSH command, you just have to give the space and in double quotes, you can actually specify the command which you want to run on the remote machine. The control will come back to your PC or Mac. It will not be in that machine and hence you don't need to type exit. Once you are comfortable with this, once you learn shell scripting, you should be able to automate the monitoring of multiple servers using this approach. The tools like Ansible and all actually are built based upon this principle only. Now, as we have gone through all the important details with respect to SSH to interact with remote servers, let's terminate the uh, instances that are provisioned from EC2 so that the costs are kept under control. We'll also talk about how to copy the files between multiple Linux systems as part of a separate section or module. But for now, we'll just terminate the two instances which we have created to explore all the key concepts related to SSH. As part of this sectional module, we have gone through the details related to overview of SSH to interact with remote servers. We have provisioned two EC2 instances and then we have gone through all the important concepts related to SSH, including password login, passwordless login and also how to run commands on remote servers using SSH. As we are done with the overview of SSH at this time, I would like to terminate both the instances which are created for the demo purpose. For that, I can actually go to EC2 management console. Let's close the other tabs. Let's click on view all instances it will take you to this page. Now with respect to the name, we have JS demo. That is the name which we have used for both the instances. Let's see if there are instances with JS demo in it. Let me refresh this. Now let me scroll down. You can see there are two instances with JS demo in it. We should be able to search for JS demo here. Now you can see both the instances. You should be able to select all. Then you can actually go to instance state and then click on terminate instance. Uh, you can review the details here. Make sure you, you review so that you accidentally don't terminate the other important instances. You can also check the name here. Now you should be able to click on terminate. It will take care of terminating both the instances for us. This is how you should be able to terminate both the instances at once. That being said, uh, so far we have gone through all the important details related to SSH at a higher level. We have understood the daemon process associated with the SSH and also we have understood the important properties files. Also we played with the properties file by enabling the password login. Then we have gone through the details about how to run the commands on remote servers using SSH and then we have terminated these EC2 instances so that we are not unnecessarily charged. As part of this sectional module, we are going through the details related to basic networking concepts using Linux. To demonstrate, I will be provisioning EC2 instance from AWS with Ubuntu 20.04 operating system. In this case, I will be provisioning a bit higher end system than T2.micro, which means you have to pay for it. Depending upon the number of hours you use, you have to pay for it. You can go to the pricing calculator and you can enter the details to get the estimate. In this case, I will be using T2.medium. Let me go to the pricing calculator. I can actually go to this link calculator.aws.com. Once you are here, you can click on create estimate. It shouldn't take more than four to eight hours to complete this complete section. And we'll be using a t2.medium instance to take care of this. We can actually search for EC2 here. Click on configure. We'll be using US East North Virginia. You can choose whatever you want and you can select the appropriate region here to get the cost estimate. When it comes to the operating system, it is nothing but Linux. When it comes to the instance, I'll be searching by name. The instance which I wanted to use is nothing but t2.medium. So let me search for t2.medium. You can see that you'll be getting 4GB memory and two vCPUs. This is good enough to explore all the basic concepts related to networking. Now uh, you can scroll down. Let's assume we'll be uh, using this for 10 hours in a month. It shouldn't take more than 10 hours. So this is the worst case. I'm saying uh, 10 hours per month. When it comes to the storage, let's say you will be having 30 GB storage for this. You can see that for 10 hours, it is $23.95. I think it is not right. To get the right estimate, we need to choose on-demand instances. Now you can actually see the cost. It is only $3.46. The actual cost for the instance is only $0.46. Cents. $3 is for the storage of 30 GB for the whole month. As we'll be terminating the instance along with the storage after 10 hours, even this cost will be significantly low. Within $1, you should be able to perform all the tasks that are going to be demonstrated in this sectional module using t2.medium instance. That being said, now you should be able to go here, click on launch a virtual machine or you can also go to EC2 console and then click on launch virtual machine then it will take you to the wizard we have already seen this in the past now let's say networking demo this is the name of the instance we'll be using Ubuntu 
we'll be creating only one of them. The version is nothing but 20.04. Instance type is nothing but t2.medium. Key pair is nothing but GS demo. We can leave this as is. We don't need to update any network settings here. When it comes to storage, we can upgrade it to 30 GB. Let's say 30 here. Now let's scroll down. That's it. We don't need to make any changes. You can see the storage is 30 GB. The server type is nothing but t2.medium. The operating system version is nothing but Ubuntu 20.04. After reviewing these details, we should be able to click on launch instance. It will take care of creating the instance for us. As the instance is created using jsdemo key pair, we should be able to use jsdemo.pem to connect to this instance. We need to wait until the instance is in running state. We can click on the link related to the instance. We can wait until the state is changed to running. Then we should be able to connect to this instance without any issues using jsdemo pem file. Now the instance state is changed to running. We should be able to select this. We can pick the public IPv4 DNS. Now we should be able to open the terminal. We can say ssh hyphen i tilde slash downloads, then gsdemo.pem, then ubuntu, it is the username. Then we can paste the public IPv4 DNS for this uh, EC2 instance. And then we should be able to get into the EC2 instance without any issues. You can see that I am able to log in into the EC2 instance without any issues. We should be able to run lscpu command to get the CPU details. You can see that we have two vCPUs. Also we can use free hyphen h to get the details about the memory. You can see that the memory is 4 GB. As of now the available memory is 3.5 GB. Also you can get the storage details by running df hyphen h command. You can actually see the details with respect to each and every mount point. In this case, we are interested in root mount point. You can see the size of the root mount point. It is nothing but 30 GB. As of now, 1.5 GB is being used and 28 GB is available. This is how you should be able to provision EC2 instance of type t2.medium to explore details related to networking concepts. We'll be going through all the networking concepts using this EC2 instance. As part of basic networking concepts using Linux, so far we have provisioned EC2 instance from AWS. Before going through the details related to basic networking concepts, let's understand AWS security groups. Uh, security groups is similar to firewalls. If you are already familiar about uh, firewalls in operating system, security groups is the logical abstraction of firewalls on AWS. Now you have the virtual machines such as JS demo or JS demo 1 or JS demo 2 or even networking demo. Now the security groups will be added on top of this. It's a logical group. All the traffic will go through that security group and based upon the rules, you will be able to access certain things in these virtual machines. If security groups block certain access, you will not be able to access. Let's understand how to get security group details from the EC2 instance, then we'll take it further. Now already we are in the instance that is actually started in previous lecture. With respect to security groups, you can click on security after selecting the EC2 instance. Then you should be able to get the details about the security group. You can see the security group here. You can click on it to go into the security group. When it comes to security group, you will find inbound rules and outbound rules. Typically, we don't worry too much about outbound rules. Inbound rules is more critical. It actually limits the access of the services that are going to run as part of the virtual machines that are provisioned from AWS. For that purpose, we typically use inbound rules only. Now, I have already clicked on inbound rules here. I should be able to scroll up here. For some reason, it is not showing up. I think if I click on edit inbound rules, I should be able to review all the inbound rules. As of now, there is only one inbound rule. It is related to SSH. You can check the type here. It is SSH. When we choose SSH as a type, the protocol will be TCP. The default port with respect to SSH is 22. The source is nothing but anywhere. 0.0.0.0 slash .0, .0, .0, 0 means anywhere. From anywhere, we will be able to talk to this SSH service. Because we have this entry, we are able to connect to this EC2 instance. Otherwise, we will not be able to connect to, to this EC2 instance. Now, let me go to the terminal. Already, I am in the uh, EC2 instance. I have used this command to connect to this EC2 instance. On top of the PEM file, I have specified the username and also public IPv4 DNS associated with this EC2 instance. Now, once I get into it, I should be able to run a command called as sudo service, then uh, sshd status. You can see that sshd is running. Also, you can review the port. In this case, you can hit Ctrl C to come out of this. Then you can say sudo view, then etc, then ssh then SSH 
d underscore config. This is the file which contain the entries related to SSH behavior. You can see the entry related to port. As of now, it is commented. If this is commented, it means it is using the default port, which is nothing but 22. As security group is being configured for port number 22 from anywhere, we are able to connect to this instance without any issues. Now, let me go back to the terminal. Let me come out of this without saving. Now, let me exit. I came out of the EC2 instance. Let me clear the screen. Now, let me go back to the security groups page. Let's delete this entry. I have deleted the entry completely. Now let me click on save rules. Now the rule is updated. Let's go back to the terminal here. Now let's try connecting to the EC2 instance using this command. Now it will not work because the rule is deleted. You can also validate by using telnet. In this case, I'm saying telnet and then I'm using this public IPv4 DNS. Let me paste, M is missing, let me add M, then say 22 you can see that telnet is struck. It is because the security group is updated by deleting the rule. As the rule is gone, we will not be able to connect to the instance. Now we have to add the rule back, then only we will be able to connect to the instance. That being said, let me go back to this. Let me click on edit inbound rules. Now we should be able to click on add rule. In this case, we have to choose SSH. Uh, when it comes to the source, we have to choose anywhere IPv4. Then we should be able to click on save rules. Now the rule is updated. Now we can come back here. As soon as the rule is updated, you can see that telnet is working as expected. We can come out of this by hitting control and closing square bracket and then by saying quit. Now we are out of it. Now we should be able to connect without any issues. You can see that it is connected to the EC2 instance without any gaps. This is about uh, overview of AWS security groups. Whenever a particular application or service is running in the background on the server, there will be a port associated with it. Unless and until security group is updated with that port, we will not be able to access that. In the traditional systems, we call them as firewalls. Now, security groups is abstraction in AWS to cover the responsibilities of firewalls. It will make sure that unnecessary traffic doesn't come into the servers. As we add more services, we'll explore how to update security groups so that the services are accessible from the external world through the rest of the lectures in this section. That being said, as we got clarity around security groups, now let's spend some time in understanding different types of IP addresses that are associated with a server. At this time, we are going through the details about basic networking concepts using Linux. In this lecture, I'll actually talk about different types of IP addresses. I'm not talking about different IP addresses. I'm talking about different types of IP addresses. When it comes to the EC2 instances, you should be able to get the public as well as private IP addresses by looking at the instance details. You can click on the link. It will take you to that instance. You can select and you should be able to see the private IP. You can see there is a private IP. It is nothing but this one. Also, there is a public IP. For a private IP, there is a private IP DNS. For public IP, there is public IP DNS. Now, these two are two different types of IP addresses. One is private IP, second one is public IP. You can also get the details about private IP uh, on any machine using IP space ADDR command. Typically, there will be a network device that will be attached to the private IP. You can see here. This is the private IP. You can also confirm by looking at the EC2 console. As this virtual machine is provisioned from AWS, we should be able to get the details about private IP as well as public IP using AWS EC2 console. However, for other cases, you might not be having this type of UIs. However, you should be able to use IP space ADR command to get the details about the private IP. If public IP is also attached to the computer directly, you will also see the details about public IP. However, we, when it comes to EC2 instances, the public IPs will not be directly attached to the instances. There will be abstraction to it. We will not be having access to that uh, abstraction directly. We can only get the public IP details using EC2 console. Otherwise, we have to run some complex commands to get the public IP details from the machine. That being said, this is the private IP. This is the public IP. So far, we have seen two types of IP addresses. On top of these two, we also have another type. It is nothing but localhost. Localhost spelling is nothing but this one. Again, localhost is nothing but alias to a special IP address. The special IP address is nothing but 127. Dot zero dot zero dot one. It is also called as loopback IP. You can actually see here. LO means loopback and you can see the IP address here. So on top of private IP and public IP, you will also have loopback IP or local host. This is primarily used to talk to the same host within itself. 
For example, let's say you want to connect to the local machine using SSH to see if we'll be able to talk to port number 22 using localhost, we should be able to say telnet localhost 22. You can see that it is working as expected. That means if we have private key, we should be able to connect to the same host using the same user without any gaps because SSH process is running. We'll also see few additional details as we go along in the course. We'll actually start a web server and we'll see whether we'll be able to talk to the local web server using telnet and also we'll validate using curl then we'll actually take it further. Localhost is primarily used to talk to the services that are running on that machine locally without uh, going through the public internet. That being said there are three types of IP addresses. One is loopback which is nothing but 127.0.0.1 it is also known as localhost. On top of it we have private IP and public IP. There will be a device on the server which will be attached to at least one of the private IP. You can get the details by running IP space ADDR command. When it comes to the public IP, it need not be directly attached to the computer or machine which we have logged in. In those scenarios, you will not be seeing the details about public IP here. However, by using uh, consoles like AWS CC2, we should be able to get the details related to public IPs as well. So there are three types of IP addresses, a loopback or localhost, private IP and public IP. As part of this sectional module, we are going through the details related to basic networking concepts using Linux. So far, we have gone through the details about AWS security groups and also different types of IP addresses. Now, let's uh, go ahead and install Apache Web Server. You will understand why we are installing Apache Web Server in the pursuit of understanding basic networking concepts by end of next few lectures. For now, let's go ahead and install Apache Web Server. We'll also see how to access it. Uh, in that process, we'll be even updating the security group. To install any software on Ubuntu-based operating system, one of the tools that can be used is nothing but apt. Using apt, we should be able to install. To run apt, we have to use super user or we should be able to use sudo if the user have access to sudo. In this case, Ubuntu have access to sudo and hence we can say sudo apt install apache2. Apache 2 is the component which is supposed to be installed to have Apache web server on Ubuntu 20.04 based machine. Sometimes this might fail. If it fails, first we need to update, then we have to install. In this case, it is not failing. It is actually installing the Apache web server. Once it is installed, we'll see whether it is automatically started or not. We'll also see how to manage it once it is completely installed. Now the installation is almost done. We just have to wait until it is completely done. Then we can actually take care of uh, understanding how to manage this Apache web server that is being installed. Now it is successfully installed. You can validate by saying sudo then service then apache2 then status. You can see that it is running. You can also run lsfn ltr slash etc. Uh, there should be a folder related to apache2. Uh, you can see the folder here. It is just set up which means apache2 is actually installed on this machine. In case if you wanted to restart you can use uh, service apache2 restart to restart this service. Now Apache 2 is restarted. You can validate by checking the status again. You can also stop it by saying service, the service name which is nothing but Apache 2, then stop. It will take care of stopping the service. You can validate the status by running status command again. Now it is stopped. Now to start it, you can use Apache 2 start. It will take care of starting this service. Now Apache 2 service is up and running. You can also run command called as telnet localhost 80. As the service is up and running on port 80, we are able to listen to that without any issue. Now let's hit control and closing square bracket, then hit enter, then say quit to come out of this telnet. You can also use curl command by saying curl http colon slash slash localhost. You can see the output here. It means we are able to access the application locally using curl. However, if we try to access the application from outside the EC2 instance, it will not work. In this case, to try accessing this web application that is running in this EC2 instance, we can use the public IPv4 DNS, which is nothing but this one. Then we can open another tab. Then we can say HTTP colon slash slash paste and hit enter. You can see that the application is not accessible even though the web server is running on the EC2 instance as security group is not updated to listen to port 80, it is not working. You can also validate by opening the terminal by exiting from this EC2 instance. You can say telnet, paste the public IPv4 DNS of the EC2 instance, then specify 80 as port. This is the port on which the application is running. You can hit enter. You can see that it is not able to listen to that port 80 because security group is not updated. As part of the next lecture, let's go ahead and update the security group and see whether we will be able to access this application via public IPv4 DNS, which is nothing but internally we are using public IPv4 IP itself.
Yeah, as part of this section of module, we are going through details related to basic networking concepts in Linux. So far, we have provisioned EC2 instance and also we got an overview of security groups. Then we actually talk about different types of IP addresses. Then we have installed Apache Web Server. However, the Apache Web Server is not accessible from external systems such as our PC. So in this case, we are able to access the web application from the server itself, but when we try to access the web application from remote servers such as our PC, it is not working. One of the ways to address this issue is by updating the security group. To update the security group, we can actually go to the instance here, then click on security, then click on security group name here, then click on edit inbound rules. The reason why we are updating inbound rules is because we are trying to access the application that is running inside the server from the external application. The traffic is inbound in nature. We are getting the traffic from the external systems into the server and hence it is considered as inbound. Now as part of this page where we can in edit the inbound rules, as of now only port 22 is opened. You can add a rule then you can actually specify HTTP because we have set up Apache 2 web server. By default, it will actually start HTTP based web application on port 80 and hence choosing HTTP is good enough. Then as part of this, we have several options. We have custom, we have anywhere IPv4, anywhere IPv6 and also my IP. You can choose my IP. It means you will be able to access this web application only from this IP address. Even if I share the public DNS for the EC2 instance on which my application is running, you will not be able to access because I am restricting access to only my IP. Also, if my IP changes because of the nature of my internet provider, then I'll not be able to access even from this system. That being said, for now, I'll be using my IP. Let me click on save rules. Now, let me go to the terminal first. Let's run telnet command. We can listen to the application without any issue on port 80. You can see here, instead of saying unable to connect to remote host, it is actually able, able to show this output, which means it is able to listen to port 80 on the remote host. Now, as the telnet is working, let's copy this uh, public DNS. I have copied this public DNS. Let me go to the new tab. Let me say HTTP colon slash slash paste it, hit enter. You can see that the application is accessible without any issues. As soon as we have updated the inbound rules in security groups associated with the uh, EC2 instance, the application is accessible. Both telnet as well as browser are working. This is how you should be able to open the port using uh, a security group associated with the EC2 instance to access certain applications. As we have understood how to install Apache web server and also how to access it using public uh, DNS from the external systems. Now let's talk about overview of daemon process and also ports. I'll be covering quite a few details as part of the next lecture related to daemon process and ports. Then we'll actually see few more examples to understand how the ports are associated with the daemon process and also how to access those daemon process using appropriate ports along with the IP addresses. As part of this sectional module, we are going through the details related to basic networking concepts using Linux. In that process, we have provisioned EC2 instance and also we are able to access a couple of applications that are there on it. One is nothing but SSH, second one is nothing but Apache 2. As we have a couple of daemon process or background process and also as we are able to access those, now let's get an overview of daemon or background process that are running on the machine and also the associated ports with them. As of now, the two daemon process that are running on the machine are nothing but SSHD and then Apache 2. When it comes to SSHD, it is running using uh, port 22. When it comes to Apache 2, it is running using port 80. So 22 is the port with respect to SSHD. When it comes to Apache 2, the port is nothing but 80. Now these two are running on the machine. The daemon process are nothing but SSHD and Apache 2. The ports that are associated with them are nothing but 22 and 80. Like this, there might be additional applications as well. Going forward, we'll be setting up a couple of uh, additional uh, components. One is nothing but JupyterLab. I guess JupyterLab will be running on port 8888. Also, we'll be setting up uh, MongoDB database on this machine. The port on which MongoDB will be running is nothing but 27017. Uh, we'll be understanding how to access those from our PC by opening the ports in the security groups for each and every daemon process that is running in the background which is supposed to be accessed from the external uh, systems we need to have ports opened as part of the security groups then only we'll be able to access those from the external world that being said as of now we have two daemon process that are set up by us one is there out of the box it is nothing but sshd another one is added by us which is nothing but apache 2 the way you can monitor is by using a command called as service. For that, first we need to log in into the system. 
now i'm inside the system then using sudo we should be able to validate by saying sudo service then sshd status you can see that sshd is running without any issue also you can actually run sudo service apache2 status even this one is running without any issues going forward we'll be setting up uh, a few additional uh, components on this they are nothing but mongodb and jupyter lab even there will be daemon process associated with them we will see how to uh, get the details of the daemon process and also we will see how to access those from the external world that being said a daemon process is nothing but a background process that is running all the time behind the scenes and also there is a port associated with the daemon process only using those ports we will be able to access those services without the port associated with the service we will not be able to access them as part of this sectional module we are going through the details related to basic networking concepts using linux so far we have gone through the details about provisioning ec2 instance aws security groups different types of ip addresses setting up apache web server on ubuntu and also making sure that we can access web application related to apache web server also we have gone through the details related to daemon or background process along with associated ports now it is time for us to understanding structure of ip address when it comes to ip addresses uh, they can be public private or local host or loopback local host or loopback means same all these can be either ipv4 addresses or ipv6 addresses in this case we will be talking about ipv4 addresses only whether it is a public ipv4 address or a private ipv4 address or even a loopback or local host ipv4 address we typically have four sections all the four sections are typically separated by dots you can see here this is the public ipv4 address this is private ipv4 address also you can actually connect it to the ec2 instance then you can actually say ping local host you should be able to see the details about the local host ipv4 address which is nothing but 127.0.0.1 even this one is actually have four sections and all the four sections are separated by dots when it comes to these numbers that are separated by dots this can go up to 255 it can't go beyond 255 so the maximum ip address which you can use is nothing but 255.255.255.255 most of the public ipv4 addresses will be something like this in this case you have 52 even if you ping gmail let's say ping www.gmail.com this is nothing but domain name or dns alias you can see the corresponding uh, public uh, ipv4 address for this domain it is nothing but this one this will change however the domain will remain same there are quite a lot of concepts under the hood you don't need to worry too much about those things uh, for now you just need to remember that when it comes to any ipv4 address it have four sections all the four sections are separated by dots each section can go up to 255 most of the private ipv4 addresses will be starting with uh, 172 or 192 or similar numbers public ipv4 addresses can start with anything that being said as we have understood uh, structure of ip address now it is time for us to understand concept of dns aliases or domain names for ip addresses as part of the section related to basic networking concepts using linux in the previous lecture we have gone through the details about understanding structure of ip address now let's understand uh, details about dns aliases or domain names for ip addresses you pick any domain whether it is gmail.com or bankofamerica.com or jpmorganchase.com or google.com everything will be associated with some ip address under the hood but the ip addresses are hidden from us we typically interact with remote applications via domain names or dns aliases already we have pinged www.gmail.com even though this is readable domain or dns alias under the hood it is actually pointing to this ip address any server can be typically be accessible only through ip address however it is tough for us to remember these ip addresses to access the applications that's why we will map domain to these ip addresses even if you say ping www.google.com you should be able to see the ip address associated with google.com it have 172 dot however this is public ipv4 address only when you actually ping these domains from your servers you might end up seeing a different uh, ip address altogether it is because for these domains there will be multiple ip addresses under the hood from the perspective of load balancing we will not be getting into all those advanced details at this time just keep in mind that any domain or dns alias will be mapped to ip addresses under the hood you will be able to talk to the servers only using ip address Also when it comes to AWS you need to keep few things in mind when it comes to IP addresses and corresponding DNSs in this case we have two IP addresses one is private IP address second one is public IP address for private IP address we have DNS 
you can see here this is private ip dns for public ipv4 address you can see the public ipv4 dns you can also observe that the private ip dns is actually derived from private ipv4 address when it comes to private ip dns it is nothing but ip-172-31-55-101.ec2.internal okay if you remove this and also if you remove this then if you pick it up and replace hyphens with dots it will be equivalent to this one it means AWS follows a particular standard while creating private IP DNSs from IPv4 addresses. In the similar manner, if you look at public IPv4 DNS, if you remove this part, dot compute then dot amazon aws dot com after compute it can be hyphen one hyphen two whatever it is if you pick this and remove this and also if you remove ec2 hyphen then if you only consider this and replace hyphens with dots this will be equivalent to this one so public ipv4 dns is actually derived from public ipv4 address also if you get into the ec2 instance you can run ip space addr you should be able to see the private ip address here this is private ip address when it comes to the host names, the host names are actually derived from the private IP addresses. You can actually say hostname hyphen F. It is nothing but private DNS, what we have seen here. The private IP DNS is nothing but this one. You can actually compare this with the host name. The host names are actually configured based upon the private DNSs only. And private DNS is actually derived from private IP address. So there is a strong relationship between a private IP address and private DNS as well as public IP address and public DNS in AWS EC2 instances. You need to remember this. That being said, as we have understood quite a lot of concepts related to IP addresses and DNS aliases associated with the AWS instances, now it is time for us to install additional softwares and also do necessary to actually access the applications that are added because of the softwares. We'll start with JupyterLab, then we'll actually get into the details related to MongoDB. As part of the section module, we are going through the details related to basic networking concepts using Linux. To understand basic networking concepts, we have not only provisioned EC2 instance from AWS, we have also added software such as Apache 2 on it. We have even gone through the details about opening port 80 as part of the security groups so that the web application that is set up because of the Apache 2 is accessible. Now let's take care of installing Jupyter on this machine. We'll be installing something called as JupyterLab. We should be able to install JupyterLab using pip from Python. After setting up the JupyterLab, we'll be having not only SSHD as well as Apache 2, but also JupyterLab on this EC2 instance. Now let me go to the terminal. I am in the terminal. Now let's say pip install then JupyterLab. By default, you will not be having pip on these machines. You can see that it is failing. It is saying command pip not found, but can be installed with sudo apt install python3 hyphen pip. Pip typically comes as part of python3. To confirm whether pip is already there as part of python3, you should be able to say python3 hyphen m pip. Then you should be able to specify the module which you want to install. In this case, it is nothing but JupyterLab. Let me hit enter. You can see that it is complaining saying no module named pip, which means there is no pip installed on this machine. So we should be able to use this command and we should be able to try installing pip. It might fail if the apt lists are not up to date. If this fail, we need to first update the apt list, then we have to run this command. Let's hit enter. You can see that it is complaining saying package python3 hyphen pip has no installation candidate. So in this case, we need to update apt lists. The way you can update apt lists is like this. You can say sudo apt update, hit enter. It will take care of updating the apt list for you. Now the app list is being updated. Let's wait until app list is completely updated. Now it is updated. Now we should be able to say sudo apt install python3 hyphen pip. It will take care of installing the pip for us. We just have to hit enter to continue. Now you can see that a python3 hyphen pip module is being installed. Once it is installed, we should be able to use python3 hyphen m pip command to install any library or module. We'll be using that command to install JupyterLab. Once JupyterLab is installed, we should be able to start it. And also we can configure the security groups to access JupyterLab from the external world. In this case, external world means our PC or Mac from which we are trying to access that application. Now python3 hyphen pip is installed. We should be able to run command called as python3 hyphen m pip jupyterlab hit enter it will take care of installing the jupyterlab for us however it is complaining saying unknown command jupyterlab because i have missed install in it so the actual command is nothing but python3 hyphen m pip install then jupyterlab now jupyterlab will be installed as part of this machine under python3 once it is installed we should be able to access jupyterlab by using jupyterlab command we will go through the details once the installation is complete 
now jupyter lab is successfully installed let me clear the screen now let me say jupyter lab you can see that it is failing saying command jupyter not found probably i might have to re-login let me exit now let me log in once again onto this ec2 instance once i log in let me attempt to run jupyter lab command let me say jupyter then lab now you can see that it is complaining with a different error we need to make sure that this is fixed let me go through the errors here it is saying uh, from markup safe import markup blah 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 cannot import name soft code from markup safe i don't know why it is complaining on this we need to troubleshoot the issue for now let's say jupyter notebook to see if jupyter notebook can be launched or not even jupyter notebook is not working so i need to troubleshoot this issue it seems there are few issues with respect to version compatibility let me try running this let me copy this let me go here and then let me say python 3 hyphen m let me paste it hit enter now let me actually try running jupyter lab now the jupyter lab is started so the command which i have used to fix the issue is nothing but pip install hyphen hyphen user hyphen hyphen upgrade aws hyphen sam hyphen cli because we are using ec2 instance most likely it is causing this issue there might be few things which are related to aws that are installed on that ec2 instance if you are using some other instance you might not run into this issue however if you run into this issue because of whatever reason you can try fixing it using this command that being said now jupyter lab is running we can open another tab let me open a new tab by saying duplicate tab now let me go back to the ec2 management console let me pick the public ipv4 dns let me connect to the ec2 instance by saying ssh hyphen i tilde slash downloads then jsdemo.pem then ubuntu at the rate public ipv4 dns now i am connected to the ec2 instance now i can say telnet localhost 8888 hit enter the reason why i'm using 8888 is because jupyter lab is started on that port you can see here you can also use curl command and run curl against this url it will work you can see the output here let me come out of this now let me say curl paste that url hit enter you can see the details related to the page that will be rendered when we use that link however in this case the link doesn't mean anything when we try to use it on our browser yes we have successfully set up jupyter lab and also as we are able to start it now it is time for us to understand what is ha happening when we start also we need to make sure that jupyter lab is accessible from the external world when i say external world i am talking about our pc or mac from which we want to access this jupyter lab let's go to the details so that you understand what i am talking about here as part of this section model we are talking about basic networking concepts using linux so far we have set up ec2 instance and also we have set up software such as apache 2 as well as jupyter lab in it you can see the diagram for our reference we have sshd out of the box then we have set up apache 2 and also we have set up jupyter lab also we have started jupyter lab as jupyter lab is successfully set up we are able to start without any issues now let's hit control c and kill it now let's understand Now let us understand what all different options we have to start Jupyter Lab. For that, you should be able to say Jupyter Lab, then hyphen hyphen help. You should be able to see all the options we have. The simplest command is nothing but Jupyter Lab. It will take care of starting the Jupyter Lab on localhost. We can try running Jupyter Lab command without any arguments by saying Jupyter space lab. You can see that Jupyter Lab is started on localhost with port number eight 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 eight. When Jupyter Lab is started on uh, port number eight 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 using localhost, you will not be able to access this from the external world. However, you will be able to access this from the EC2 instance itself. Let me duplicate this. Let me open a new tab by clicking on duplicate tab. Then let me connect to the EC2 instance by saying ssh hyphen i tilde slash downloads. Then jsdemo dot pem. Then I have to give the username. The username is nothing but Ubuntu. The public IP for DNS is nothing but this one. I have copied public IP for DNS. Now let me say Ubuntu at the rate public IP for DNS, which is nothing but this one. Let me hit enter. Now I am inside the EC2 instance. You should be able to access the application using two approaches. One is Telnet. It will take care of listening to the application using the port and IP address. In this case, the IP address or DNS alias related to the IP address on which the application is running is nothing but localhost. The port is nothing but eight 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 eight. 
now you can see that you are able to listen to port 8888 using localhost it is because Jupyter lab is started using this on this ec2 instance you are trying to access the application from the ec2 instance itself if you go back to this picture in this case the telnet is being run from the ec2 instance itself that's why it is working now let me go here let me come out of this by saying control closing square bracket hit enter then quit now i am outside the telnet now let me use the private ip or dns associated with the private ip we can get the details about uh, private dns by saying hostname hyphen f on ec2 instance this is the ipv4 dns for private ip i should be able to copy this then say telnet paste port number is nothing but 8888 you can see that it is complaining saying unable to connect to remote host even though you are able to talk to this application using localhost and port number 8888 you are not able to talk to the application using private ip or dns associated with the private ip and port 8888 even with public dns you will not be able to access this application let's say telnet let's give the public dns the public dns is nothing but this one i have copied it let me go back to the terminal let me paste it here then say 8888 hit enter it is saying uh, connection refused which means even using public dns or public ip and port 8888 we are not able to talk to this application that is running currently using localhost now let me hit control c let me say why let me come out of this then let's explore different options that are there to start jupyter lab to see all the options you should be able to get the help by saying jupyter lab hyphen hyphen help you can see all the details here you can customize the ip address by using hyphen hyphen ip you can actually specify the ip address here either you can use localhost which is default or you can configure private ip address or you can also use universal ip address the universal ip address is nothing but 0.0.0.0, .0. when we use 0.0.0.0, .0, .0, .0 uh, the application will be bound to all the ip addresses associated with this machine so in this case to make sure we can access the application both via localhost as well as private ip and public ip or dnss associated with the private ip and public ip we have to use 0.0.0.0, .0, 0, .0, 0 with -ip then it will work as expected now let me say jupyter space lab then hyphen hyphen ip then 0.0.0.0 .0 you can also specify equal between ip and this one even space will work now let's hit enter now you can see that it is bound to the private ip as well as uh, loopback uh, ip or localhost ip now we can go here then we should be able to validate whether we'll be able to listen to that application via localhost or not by using this command you can see that we are able to listen without any issues let me come out of it now let's go ahead and run telnet using a private dns even this one is working let me come out of it now let me try using public dns even this one is working you can see that even when we use public dns it is actually getting into the application using private ip only which means from the external world when we use public ip it is actually mapped to the private ip associated with the server however uh, still we will not be able to access the application the reason why we will not be able to access the application is because uh, as part of the security group the port number is not opened now let me copy this let me go to the browser here let me open a new tab now let me say http colon slash slash then the public dns colon 8888 that is the port on which uh, jupyter lab is running now you can see that uh, we are not able to access the jupyter lab environment even though uh, the jupyter lab is started by using 0.0.0.0, .0 as part of ip we need to make sure the port is opened as part of the security group then we'll be able to access the application without any issues let's go to the details about updating the security group to access jupyter lab as part of the next lecture as part of this sectional module, we are going through the details related to basic networking concepts using Linux. In that process, so far we have set up uh, Apache 2 as well as Jupyter Lab on top of SSHD. SSHD comes out of the box. Because of SSHD only, we are able to connect to the EC2 instance using SSH. Also, after installing Apache 2 to access the uh, web application associated with Apache 2, we have opened port number 80 as part of the security group. As of now, we have even set up Jupyter Lab on the EC2 instance. However, it is not accessible even though it is being run using port number 8888 let me update the port number here it is nothing but 8888 
However, we are not able to access this because security group is not updated yet. Let's go ahead and take care of updating the security group and see if we'll be able to access the Jupyter Lab without any issues. For that, we can go to the EC2 management console. We need to make sure appropriate EC2 instance is selected. This is the EC2 instance which is being used for the demonstrations. Once it is selected, you can go to the security. Then you should be able to click on security group associated with this EC2 instance. Now we have to edit inbound rules because we are trying to access Jupyter Lab from the external world. The traffic is inbound into the server and hence we have to edit inbound rules. Now we can say edit inbound rules. Now we should be able to say add rule. In this case we have to use custom TCP only. The protocol is TCP. Port range is nothing but 8888. The source let's say my IP. You can also use anywhere and you can actually configure with 0.0.0.0 slash .0, .0, 0. In that case anyone can access your uh, Jupyter Lab environment. In this case, I have configured this rule using my IP, which means I'll be able to access Jupyter Lab environment running on EC2 instance only from this system where this IP address is mapped. From other systems, we will not be able to access Jupyter Lab. That being said, we need to make sure we save the rules by clicking on save rules. Once it is saved, we should be able to go here refresh this. Now we should be able to access the application without any issues. You can also go to the terminal. You can come out of this session. And also you can exit from EC2 instance. Now you can say telnet, give the public DNS, which is nothing but this one. Then port 8888. You should be able to listen to Jupyter application that is running on this uh, instance using port 8888. In this case, I'm running telnet from the external PC, which is nothing but my Mac. Now you can see that you are able to access the application even using telnet from the PC onto that EC2 instance. This telnet is being run from our PC. If you relate it to this diagram, now Telnet is being run from here. Also, our browser is here. We are able to access the application using public DNS along with port number 8888. You can see here. However, it is not logged in automatically because I haven't copied the token. Now to pick the token, I can go back to the terminal. Let me go to the terminal here. Then let me go to this session where Jupyter Lab is started. You can see the token here. We can copy this token. Then go to the browser, paste the token here. Click on login. Now it should be able to log in into the Jupyter Lab environment without any issues. This is how you can actually set up any application on the EC2 instance. And then you should be able to open the ports as part of the security groups. Once the ports are opened as part of the security groups, you should be able to access these applications from the external world. In this case, Jupyter Lab is set up using port 8888 with universal IP 0.0.0.0. .0 as the Jupyter Lab is running using universal IP 0.0.0.0 .0 .0 .0 on port 8888, and also as port 8888 is opened as part of the security groups from my PC, I'm able to access this without any issues. As part of this sectional module, we are going through the details related to basic networking concepts using Linux. So far, we have set up uh, Apache 2 as well as Jupyter Lab on top of SSHD. SSHD comes out of the box, whereas Apache 2 and Jupyter Lab are not only installed, but also the ports associated with the applications related to these are actually opened as part of the security groups. Now, let's understand how to install databases like MongoDB on these EC2 instances. And also, let's go through the details about how to access these databases from external world. When I say external world, I'm referring to the PCs or Macs associated with us. That being said, let's go ahead and install MongoDB on this machine. Then we will take it further. Once again, you should be able to get into the EC2 instance. If your Jupyter Lab session is still active, you can hit Ctrl C and then say Y to kill the session. Then you should be able to say apt install. You have to pass appropriate value with respect to MongoDB. For that purpose, we can actually go to the browser. Then open a new tab, go to the google.com, search for install mongodb ubuntu 20.04. Now we should be able to uh, click on this, how to install mongodb on ubuntu 20.04. This link is from uh, DigitalOcean. It is a reliable link. Now you should be able to scroll down. Then you should be able to copy this go to the terminal, paste it. Once that is done, you can actually run this command apt key list. You can see the keys here. Now you should be able to copy this, then paste here. 
then you can actually scroll down then run this to update the apt lists you can see that the apt lists are being updated with the mongodb related stuff once it is done then you should be able to copy paste this which will take care of installing the mongodb on this ec2 instance with the ubuntu 20.04 operating system now you can see that mongodb org is being installed i have just hit enter to confirm now it is actually installing the mongodb database once it is installed we should be able to start the service using this command either you can use systemctl or service command let's try copying this uh, if it doesn't work then we'll actually switch over to uh, service command let's go back to the terminal it is installed now we should be able to copy this paste here now the mongodb service is started you should be able to validate the status by copy pasting this command you can see that the mongodb database server is running without any issues there is a configuration file associated with the mongodb that is installed you can review the details by opening this configuration file we can say cat then slash etc slash mongod hyphen conf hit enter you can actually see that the port on which mongodb is running is nothing but 27017 the ip to which it is bound is nothing but the local host ip which is nothing but 127.0.0.1 for that reason when we say telnet then local host then 27017 we should be able to uh, listen to that port without any issues however if we use uh, uh, public dns or private dns it will not work let me first use the private dns we should be able to get the private dns on ec2 instance by running this command this is nothing but private dns let's copy this now let's say telnet paste it and then 27017 hit enter you can see that it is complaining saying connection refused now let's also try telnet using public dns the public dns associated with this ec2 instance is nothing but this one uh, let me uh, go to the ec2 console here let me say reload it will take care of uh, going back to the ec2 instance uh, in this case it is actually going to the wizard let me click on instances here the instance which we are interested in is nothing but uh, this one networking uh, demo now we should be able to uh, get the public dns by clicking on this let's go to the terminal let's say telnet then paste the public dns then say 27017 you can see that it is complaining which means as of now the database is accessible only from the ec2 instance if we try to relate to this picture now we also have mongodb running on port number 27017 on this ec2 instance however using localhost we should be able to connect to this mongodb database but from the outside world we will not be able to connect to it also from within ec2 instance we will not be able to connect to it using either private dns or public dns let's try connecting to mongodb cli by saying mongo hit enter you can see that you are connected without any issues as we are trying to connect from the ec2 instance itself you can see that it is trying to connect using this information now let's understand how to make sure the mongodb runs on all the ips associated with the ec2 instance also we need to make sure the ports are opened as part of the security group so that from the external world such as our pc or mac will be able to connect to this mongodb database that is running on the ec2 instance at this time we are going through the details related to basic networking concepts using linux after setting up apache 2 as well as jupyter lab now we are in the process of setting up mongodb and also accessing it from the external world already mongodb is set up on the ec2 instance uh, it is covered as part of the previous lecture uh, we can also see that we are able to access mongodb from the ec2 instance itself uh, once i log in into the ec2 instance i can say mongo it is actually using this information to connect to the mongo instance now let me come out of this let me say mongo hyphen hyphen help to get the usage of mongo if you have mongo client installed on specific machine you should be able to specify the host name by using hyphen hyphen host in this case even though we are in the same instance on which mongo is set up we should be able to specify the private dns or public dns associated with this ec2 instance using hyphen hyphen host if everything is working as expected we should be able to launch mongo without any issues let me say hostname hyphen f so that i can get the private uh, dns uh, this is the private dns now i can say mongo hyphen hyphen host let's start with localhost it should work without any issues you can see that it is connected using localhost however if i exit from here then if i say mongo hyphen hyphen host then specify the private dns 
let me paste the private dns here now the private dns is pasted you can see that it try to connect using this information however it is failing because as of now mongodb server is actually running using localhost only to fix this we need to update the configuration file you can choose the uh, editor of your choice i'll be using va editor uh, in this case i can say sudo vi slash etc slash mongodb.conf now you have to go to the line where you have bind ip as part of the bind ip you can actually change it to 0.0.0.0, .0. if you're not comfortable using editors you can also say sudo then scd hyphen i then s slash 127.0.0.1 you can actually specify 0.0.0.0 then slash g then you should be able to specify the file name which is nothing but etc mongodb.conf now the file should have been updated you can validate by saying cat slash etc slash mongodb.conf now you can review the value for bind ip it is nothing but universal ip 0.0.0.0, .0. now we should be able to access mongodb either by using localhost or private dns let's start with localhost by saying mongo hyphen hyphen host uh, localhost you can see that it is working as expected now let's get the private dns for this uh, ec2 instance it is nothing but this one now let me say mongo hyphen hyphen host then let me copy paste this private dns however it will fail even though we have updated the configuration file we haven't bounced the mongodb server we need to make sure mongodb server is bounced after making the change uh, to bounce we should be able to use sudo systemctl command we can actually specify the mongo or mongodb let's uh, go through the earlier commands which we have used for that i can actually say history pipe grep then systemctl the command which we can use is nothing but sudo systemctl restart mongodb or mongodb.service either of them will work now let's try connecting to the mongodb using this command you can see that it is working as expected you can also come out of this then say telnet then copy this uh, uh, private dns then say 27017 you can see that we are able to talk to mongodb server running on port number 27017 via private ip you can also come out of this then get the public ip or public dns related to this uh, ec2 instance which is nothing but uh, this one let me copy this now let me say telnet let me paste it then let me say 27017 you can see that it is working as expected we can come out of it you can also say mongo hyphen hyphen host specify the public dns you can see that it is working as expected however if we come out of this session i'm already out of this session now if i say telnet then public dns then say 27017 you see it is struck even though uh, mongodb is running using universal ip 0.0.0.0, .0 i'm not able to connect from the external source because the security group is not updated it is important for us to update the security group in aws environment we have to update security group in other environments it might be called as firewalls so either you have to deal with security groups or firewalls to open the port 27017 so that the external world can connect to the mongodb that is running as part of this ec2 instance i'll be covering those details as part of the next lecture at this time we are going through the details related to basic networking concepts using linux so far we have set up multiple softwares on top of this ec2 instance they are nothing but apache 2 jupyter lab as well as mongodb uh, on top of these things we also have sshd out of the box on top of setting up these softwares we have also uh, made sure that the applications associated with these softwares are running and also ports are opened so that we can access those applications as of now with respect to mongodb the port is not open and hence we will not be able to talk to the mongodb database from external world let's understand how to update security group so that we can access mongodb database from the external world we just have to go to ec2 management console we need to make sure we go to the appropriate security group for that we have to choose the appropriate ec2 instance in this case the appropriate ec2 instance is nothing but this one once the appropriate ec2 instance is selected you can click on security then you should be able to click on this one to go to the security group now you are in the security group already you can see that ports 22 80 and 8888 are opened now we have to open another port 
the port is nothing but 27017. In this case also, we are actually getting the traffic inbound to EC2 instance because we are trying to connect to MongoDB database from the external world and MongoDB database is running as part of this EC2 instance. It is also categorized under inbound traffic and hence we have to update inbound rule. First, we have to click on add rule here. Then we can specify custom TCP. In this, we have to say 27017. When it comes to the source, you can choose my IP. Only from my system with this IP, I'll be able to connect to MongoDB database. If the IP changes, we have to update the rule as well. Th that being said, we should be able to click on save rules. It will take care of updating the rule. Now we can actually go to the terminal, then run telnet with public DNS along with port number 27017. You can see that I'm able to talk to the database that is running as part of the EC2 instance with this public DNS on this port 27017. Now, to make sure we can connect to the MongoDB database, we need to have Mongo client. Only then we'll be able to connect to MongoDB database. Let me check if I have Mongo client or not on this machine. There's no Mongo client and hence I'll not be able to connect to the MongoDB database directly. First, I need to make sure I install Mongo client, then only I'll be able to connect to the MongoDB that is running on the remote machine. To install the Mongo client, let me search as part of Homebrew because I'm actually using Mac. For that, I can actually say brew search Mongo. Let me hit enter. Let me see if there is a client software. There is Mongo CLI, there is Mongos, there is Mongoose. There are many other things. Let me try using Mongo CLI. I'm not 100% sure whether it will work or not, but I'll try to install Mongo CLI. Then I will see if I'll be able to access MongoDB that is running on top of EC2 instance using this Mongo CLI. Now Mongo CLI is being installed on this Mac. If you are using uh, Windows, you need to make sure Mongo client is installed. To confirm that you can actually talk to the MongoDB that is running on EC2 instance. Even when it comes to Ubuntu, you need to figure out how to install Mongo client to validate this. However, it is not important for you to validate whether you can talk to the MongoDB database using Mongo client uh, or not at this time. As long as you understand the relevance of running the uh, components on uh, servers using uh, universal IP, and as long as we are able to listen to the components via Telnet from the external world, we are good to go. We don't have to validate using command line utilities or clients to actually confirm whether it is working or not. Telnet is more than enough. Let's wait until Mongo CLI is installed, then we'll take it further. Now the Mongo CLI is installed. We should be able to validate by saying Mongo and hitting enter. You can see that it is complaining Mongo command not found. Let me say Mongo and let me see if Mongo CLI can be accessible. Still, it is not accessible. Let me try installing once again. It is saying it is already installed, but uh, it is not working as expected. Don't worry too much about this. You just uh, validate using Telnet. As long as you are able to use Telnet, you are good to go. If you are good at Python programming, you should be able to use PyMongo and you should be able to validate without any issues. But in this case, Telnet is working and hence we are good to go. Uh, we are able to talk to MongoDB database that is running as part of EC2 instance. As we have covered quite a lot of details with respect to understanding basic networking concepts using multiple softwares of different categories, now it is time for us to wrap up by cleaning up the EC2 instance that is provisioned to explore these things. I'll be taking care of terminating this instance as part of the next lecture. As part of this sectional module, we have gone through details related to basic networking concepts using Linux. We have set up uh, EC2 instance and then we have installed quite a few softwares on top of it. SSHD comes out of the box. We have installed additional software such as Apache 2, JupyterLab and also MongoDB. We have also gone through concepts such as uh, different types of IP addresses. We have understood the structure of IP addresses. We have also gone through the details about DNS aliases for the IP addresses. Also, we have gone through the concepts such as daemon process or background process along with port numbers associated with them. Uh, for each and every software we have seen here, uh, there is a daemon process associated with it. We have seen how to make sure that daemon process is started using universal IP which is nothing but 0.0.0.0, .0, so that the applications are accessible from the external world. As we have gone through all the details related to basic networking concepts using Linux, now it is time for us to terminate the EC2 instance. For that, we can actually go to EC2 management console. Let's go to the instances. 
In this case, we'll also make sure that volume is deleted. You can actually go to the storage to get the volume name. The volume name is nothing but this one. It ends with D94. The size is nothing but 30 GB. And currently it is attached to this EC2 instance. Now we should be able to select this and then we can go to instance state. Then we should be able to click on terminate instance so that the instance is terminated. Once the instance is terminated, we should be able to go to the volumes to confirm whether the volume ending with D94 is still there or not. Let me go to volumes here. Let me uh, go through all the volumes here. We can actually search for D94. You can see the one with D94 here. It is still in use because the EC2 instance is being terminated. Let's go to the EC2 instance dashboard and see whether EC2 instance is already terminated or not. In this case, we are talking about this one. It is currently being shut down. Let's refresh until it says terminated. Now it is terminated. We can actually go to the volumes. We should be able to refresh here. Let's see if the one with D92 is still here. To simplify the search process for the uh, volume that is associated with the terminated instance, I have sorted the volumes by size. As part of this list, only there are two volumes with 30 GB in size. These two volumes are associated with these two instances, which means the volume associated with the terminated instance is gone. Uh, this is how you should be able to clean up the instance and also volume. If you terminate the instance, automatically the volume will be deleted. In some cases it might not. You can review and you can actually delete manually. That being said, I hope you have understood all the key concepts with respect to networking. Make sure you are comfortable with these basic networking concepts. They will help you in troubleshooting complex issues while you work as part of the projects in real-time environment. You need to practice enough to get hold of these key networking concepts. As part of this sectional module, we, we are going through the details related to copying files between Linux systems. In this case, we'll be provisioning two EC2 instances from AWS so that we have multiple systems to explore all the details related to copying files between Linux-based systems. Also, we'll be copying files from our PC uh, which is either Mac or Linux on top of Windows onto the systems and also vice versa. The source is nothing but RPC. The target uh, will have two systems. They are nothing but two EC2 instances from AWS. That being said, let's go ahead and provision two EC2 instances with Ubuntu 20.04 with copy demo as name. Uh, I am already in EC2 console. As part of the EC2 console, you should be able to click on launch instance in EC2 dashboard. In EC2 console, I'm in EC2 dashboard, you can see here. We have launch instance here. I'm going to use this to launch instance. It will take us to the uh, launch instance wizard. Now we should be able to specify the name. The name is nothing but copy demo. When it comes to the operating system, it is nothing but Ubuntu. I'll be using Ubuntu 20.04. Let me pick Ubuntu 20.04. Even you can use other versions of Ubuntu as well. Copying files will not differ based on the version of Ubuntu. Whether it is Ubuntu 16.04 or 18.04 or 20.04 or 22.04, it doesn't matter. It will work as expected. That being said, when it comes to the instance type, I'll be using t2.micro. These are free tier eligible. When it comes to key pair, it is nothing but GS demo. When it comes to storage, I'll be configuring 16 GB. 8 GB might not be good enough. Let's make sure to have at least 16 GB. Now we should be able to increase the number to 2. You can review the details here. The operating system is nothing but Ubuntu 20.04. Server type is nothing but t2.micro. We are going to create a new security group. The storage volume is of size 16 GB. We are provisioning two such instances. Now we should be able to click on launch instance. It will take care of creating the two instances. Once the two instances are created, we should be able to use SSH to connect to the instances. We have to use gsdemo private key file, which is nothing but gsdemo.pem, which is already downloaded when we have created EC2 key pair earlier. That being said, let's wait until the instances comes up. Then we'll take it further. Yeah, as part of this lecture, let's get an overview of case sensitivity in Linux, especially when it comes to the file names in Linux. If you look at these three strings, even though all three are error, they are not same. This is in lowercase, which means all the characters are in lowercase. This is in uppercase, which means all the characters are in uppercase. This is in mixed case. Uh, as only the first character is in uppercase and the rest in lowercase, it is known as capitalized. Uh, you also might have mixed case in many ways. The most important ones are lowercase and uppercase. Typically, we use either lowercase or uppercase when it comes to the file names in Linux. Now, if I say touch, then say demo, you can see that 
the file demo is created actually there is a folder also by name demo it have updated the properties of folder demo let's say touch demo case now a new file should have been created let me say demo star you can see here this is file uh, these are related to demo folder now let me actually say ls hyphen ltr demo c star then we'll be seeing only the file related to demo case now let me say touch then demo c a s c in this case a s c are in uppercase now if i say ls hyphen ltr demo c star you will be seeing two files one all in lowercase one last three characters in uppercase even though uh, they pronounce same these two are two different files it is very very important for you to understand this uh, when it comes to linux or even in unix it is case sensitive whether it is file names or data in windows it is contrasting to this many times when we actually specify the files with the same spelling but with different cases both will be considered as same in windows if you are working in windows for quite some time this can be a little bit confusing in the beginning when you actually transition to linux make sure you overcome that as early as possible that being said as we have understood the case sensitivity in linux let's go to the details related to troubleshooting the issues using find and grep in linux many times this case comes into the picture